Hey everyone, uh, no one here in the, in the room yet, but those who may be on Zoom, uh, I'd like to call to order the Board of Ed Education Regular Board meeting of June 13, 2023. Are there any requests to speak? There are no requests to speak from the public, so we will adjourn to closed session. Thank you. Everyone here in the boardroom and those who are joining us by Zoom, I'm calling back to order um, our board meeting of June uh, uh, 13, 2023. Now we'll have uh, language access. Thank you. Good evening. We have language access available. So we have Spanish interpretation in person and also over Zoom. And we also have ASL interpretation available through Zoom. So if you click on the interpretation globe, you will have an option to select ASL and that will spotlight the ASL interpretation. Muy buenas tardes, tenemos interpretación al español disponible por si alguien gusta escuchar la presentación en español. Thank you, gracias. Okay, now we can see the Pledge of Allegiance. from closed session. Um, let's make sure I have the right information. Okay. The board voted and voted 5-0 to deny the student claim against the district referencing agenda item C3. Um, it's closed session item three in the case of, um, just want to make sure I have several numbers here. We don't have a case number, but it's board item, closed board item session number three. The voting was four, five zero. The board also approved in closed session the improvement of Maggie Flores as director of early childhood and after school programs by unanimous vote in closed session, which was also five five zero, and that is also item five. Also in closed session, the board took action to approve or ratify the May 25th, 2023 final settlement agreement and release and discharge between parents and district and student versus Santa Barbara Unified School District Special Education Praise Case 0, excuse me, 20230010672. That concludes closed session items. Now we'll go to the student board member report, Ms. Kavya. Hello, welcome everyone. Happy June, end of the school year for me. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight and I have a few things to share. So after our last meeting, we wrapped up our superintendent advisory council with a really valuable reflection on what we learned this year and what we also accomplished this year. And it was really rewarding, honestly, to see the work that we did, just giving input and giving feedback to the superintendent, to the school district, seeing how that culminated in actual you know, action and initiatives. That was really incredible to see. We also were able to meet um, and get to know the next student board member, Anastasia Lee, and we we're just really excited as a group to continue the work that we did this year, next year, with new goals and new priorities and new initiatives. And beyond that, I was able to also attend the State of Schools, which was incredible to just, again, see the work that we're actually doing in the district beyond just the talk and beyond the ideas and the thinking. We're really creating change that's so rewarding to witness as a student. And after that, I also had the opportunity to attend San Marcos High School's graduation on June 8th. And it was so incredible to see the nearly 500 graduates just beam with pride and excitement. Um, you know, they were deprived of some of their freshman year and their sophomore year, and they had gone through so much adversity. And it's so incredible to see such a resilient group rise from all of that and take charge of their future and take charge of their education and see so many people pursue so many different pathways after high school. And so I think we're all just really, all of us are really honored to just be in that excitement that our sixth graders experienced, our eighth graders experienced, and our twelfth graders experienced with promotion, with graduation, and with their future. Um, and I'm really inspired by all the resilient and hardworking individuals that we're able to celebrate. And with that, I don't have much more to add. But thank you all very much. I'm excited for a good meeting. Thank you. Superintendent report. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank and give a nice big shout out to our principals for being here tonight. I know they've gone to rest 
and also to cabinet or board members and everyone who had a chance to really hear their amazing plans for single plans, uh, single plans for student achievement, their safety plans. And I know that they are definitely tired. Um, I'm going to start with talking a little bit about the Santa Barbara Junior High mural. Um, we did go into graduation season, but we, I do want to mark that Santa Barbara Junior High School graduated their 90th class this year. And they commemorated the 90th year with this amazing art feature that was created by students and staff. And the decorations are basically one feather for either staff or student of that class. And in the front, they have a statement about what makes them um, special. And in the back, what makes them soar, because that's their, their theme. I want to thank everyone that contributed to this project, especially PJ Carmen, who did the um, had the idea and then went to San Barbara Foundation for funding. Um, so if you ever feel like taking a picture with these beautiful wings, stop by San Barbara Junior High, and we'll see what they have in store for the next 90 years. <clears throat> As they prepare, of course, excuse me, <clears throat> scientists, engineers, writers, artists, athletes, and more. Next, I'd like to talk about all the graduations. I'm so inspired, impressed, grateful. This is a beautiful picture from St. Marcos, but I know we could show you pictures forever. I, I had an opportunity to attend those Pueblos. As you know, our high schools always do their graduations on the same day, same time. So I've only been able to go to one a year. This is my third year. I finally got to go to those Pueblos. And I was uh, also really uh, happy to see the beautiful, uh, way that children cover their cap with uh, messages. I know that the first speaker had si se pudo, past tense, yes, it was that like, we could, we did it, right? Yes, we can do it, yes, we did do it. Translating in my brain. Um, so we have more than 1,500 students graduate from Santa Barbara Unified. Many are going on to college, others are going to the military, joining the workforce, and we want to congratulate this class. It is a very special class, as you know, they went through the heavy uh, times of the pandemic. I also want to recognize that June is Pride Month. Our district recognizes the contributions of LGBTQ plus individuals here in our community and we want all our students, faculty, staff and parents to feel seen, valued, heard here in our district, especially uh, this group during Pride Month. I would like to invite up First, um, and introduce here our new Director of Special Education, Dr. Carla Curry, uh, who has been the interim, so she's already been doing the job and has been part of the reorganization of our new Student and Family Services Department. And I'll turn it over to her to say a few words. Well, I'd like to thank the school board. Oh. Go back. Yeah. Okay. I would like to thank the school board and Dr. Maldonado for the opportunity to serve as the Special Education Director for the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Special Education has allowed me to be part of the lives of so many amazing students and families. I have grown so much as a person by being a part of the Special Education community. And to me, the students and families that I have served over the years will always be close to my heart and continue to drive my work. Working together, I am positive that staff, parents, and the community partners will continue, to, will continue the district's efforts to ensure all students are valued and worthy of our best efforts. I would like to say a special thank you to all the students, teachers, and staff, and families that have offered such a warm welcome, and I look forward to returning to the 23-24 school year with a sense of optimism and positivity. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Curry, for coming to Santa Barbara Unified and staying with us and taking all these responsibilities. We're really lucky to have you. Um, I also, over Zoom, and I'm just gonna look at my staff, she's ready. Uh, we have Dr. Deborah Martinez, who will be our new Director of Educational Equity and Support for Multilingual Learners. Um, and I'd like to invite her to also say a few words and introduce herself to the board. Dr. Martinez, are you with us? Yes, good evening, uh, Superintendent Dr. Maldonado, uh, Board President. Uh, One second, Dr. Martinez, I want to make sure we can hear you. Okay, you can start again, Dr. Martinez. Go ahead. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Dr. Uh, no, not yet. One second. We're having. She's off. She's off. I think you need to unmute yourself because we can't hear you. Um, Let's see. Try how about again. Now? How about now? 
No, you're still too low on our end. Um, how about now? We're going to troubleshoot you and bring you back, Dr. Martinez. I'm going to have somebody call you. Okay. Uh, so let me continue my report, and if one of you can call her and just check on her settings. Stand by, Dr. Martinez. We'll be right with you. Okay, next. Um, so students graduate and teachers retire. And so I also want to recognize that we did uh, hold a small event here last week for our retirees. And I know we have um, some photos that we wanted to show, but if we can't because of the Zoom, I just want to say that we really want to thank all the employees that um, have decided to continue in their next chapter in life by retiring. And they were very happy. We were very happy for them. But we also were pleased to hear some of the plans that they have, like traveling, taking time to rest and get up late. And uh, we were so honored to have them come to the district office. Um, they have given decades of dedicated work to our community and want to just thank them for everything they have done for our students. Um, and I know Noemi Vasquez is somebody from the district office that's going to be dearly missed. Um, but it's time sometimes to pass on the knowledge to others. So thank you to our retirees as well. So last, uh, board members, um, I won't be here for the last meeting on June 27th. I'll be attending a conference. So since I'm not going to be here, I want to take time to honor our student board member, Kaida Suresh. And we have a couple of gifts for her. So I'm just going to open this up. I'm just going to come over here. <laughs> Um, we have a small plaque for Kavya that I'll read. I hope you guys can still hear me on Zoom. Thank you. So Kavya, thank you for your service to our school district in recognition of being the second student board member for the 2022-2023 school year. We want to thank you. Uh, it says, uh, it, we thank you for being epic, essential, phenomenal, inspiring, and courageous. And everybody loves socks and a water bottle and a drink bottle. So, and a couple of other goodies yeah. and a bag. So, thank you, Kavya. And board members, I know that I've said this before, but Kavya is my teacher. I've always said my mom is my first teacher. I'll always say that. I have other amazing teachers, but Kavya is my youth teacher. She really has so many wise words that she shares with so many of us about life. I mean, just at dinner a few minutes ago, she was telling us how she manages herself. And it's an incredible sign of intelligence when you know that the first person you need to manage is yourself instead of trying to manage others. So uh, with that, I'm going to look to my team and see how are we doing with Dr. Martinez. No. We won't be able, we could bring her later on maybe. OK, Dr. Martinez, hang, hang tight. We'll try to be in later on. I'm not going to do Heroes of the Heart. We actually had a video showing through the break or right before we came between closed session and open session. But we had over 120 additional people to recognize. So what Oscar did, yes, give him a nice round of applause. What Oscar did is he created a video that has the names by school uh, sites, and we'll post that on our website along with everybody else and run, let that run through the summer so that people can see all the incredible heroes that work for Santa Maria Unified, and that ends my report. Thank you, Board President. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bonanno and Kavya, of course. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, one more. I have to do this one. I have to do this one. I had the honor of going to Goleta Valley Junior High School this morning and welcome 92 teachers from elementary, which is almost half of our teachers in elementary that came for an all-day training today of the Wit and Wisdom New Reading Program. And I have to tell you, in my years as a, an educator and having gone through many adoptions, I've never seen that many teachers excited to come. I do want to thank Denise and the team, uh, Dr. Monroe, for giving them a nice incentive, which means that 
they're coming now when they have to come back that first day of August 16th, they get to do other things. So we provided a nice incentive for them, but they were so, uh, I, I'm so grateful to have so many teachers care already about what they're gonna be teaching. It brought me back to my time as a teacher of teachers. And I, I did say to them, well, we may say this is a great curriculum. This is the best thing, you know, since sliced bread. It's the teachers that are going to make the difference. And so I just want to make sure the board knows how happy I am and excited to see so many different um, teachers. Now I'm really done. Thank you. Well, that's that's great news. Uh, see the dead okay. okay, there's somebody else raised their hand. Okay, we have Dr. Martinez. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Nope. Are you able to hear me now? Anyways. She'll call in. No, we're still not hearing you. No, you can't hear me? Very well. Yes? You can call in. Chris, okay. Mr. Sorry, Dr. Martinez. We'll try it okay. again a little bit. I can just do Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> Great. So yes, we'll we will we'll keep trying to make sure that we get Dr. Martinez on tonight. So appreciate that. So uh, congratulations on the teachers that are there. We'll see the the commitment and the excitement there. So certainly looking to forward to them and hoping they're having a, a great day today and all well, all that they had to do. And Kavya, you know, it goes without saying, just who you are, right? Of course, we're going to miss you here. Uh, on our Tuesdays here, but know that you're never far away, and I, and I don't uh, don't believe that you won't be at the podium at some point. So uh, <laughs> you may be in a different place, but you know uh, your your heart is always in the students. And just appreciate again, as Dr. Maldonado said, the lesson that you taught us in being open to that, and being transparent, and being vulnerable, and and, and you know when the decision was made to uh, add a student board member, we had no idea. The level of you know that the board itself would be elevated by having a student voice on there, and certainly starting with Dawson, if you guys are building it, literally building it right, and each time it's, it's building up, building strong, and facing that foundation. And we look forward to a new board member, student board member that's coming above too. So again, uh, thank you for that, and, and I look forward to seeing you there because I know that. <laughs> so so thank you for that. Uh, with that, uh, board members, um, any comments and or correspondence? South Carolina. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening, Tavia. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for being here. Uh, I look forward to hearing all the wonderful things that you'll do. You're, I have no doubt that you will be just continue to be amazing and very happy to have been part of your journey. So don't, just don't be a stranger. And um, a couple of updates. Uh, it's been extremely busy since last meeting. It's a lot of joy and happiness, as Dr. Maldonado mentioned. And one of the events that I've had the great privilege to attend is the emergent multilingual Santa Barbara High School reclassification and GPA celebration, as well as parent education. And it was it's so amazing that principal Dr. Simmons and her staff, Maria Jimenez, Lynette Santana, my supporter, Marta Acevedo, and I'm sure I missed, <laughs> there were so many staff members, I'm sure I missed naming them. So my appreciation, my gratitude for all that extra work that they do to make this possible and support the students and parents, the joy that you see on their faces, just you can't even describe that. So thank you. And I was very honored to be there. And also, I was also able to attend the meeting at Dos Pueblos High School with the counselors, the RAMP committee. And I continue to be impressed, to be amazed by their dedication, their intentionality to help the students. They reviewed their goals and they were so honest about, okay, we didn't meet this goal and this is the reason why and what are we going to do better? And it's all 100% student centered. So I. Uh, very, very happy about this. Very grateful to Mr. Woodard for his support, the community members that were there, and of course to the counseling team and to be able to be part of that. I'm extremely grateful and look forward to continuing that work. 
In addition to that, I was also at the Lacuna Junior High Award Ceremony, and it's it's so uplifting that energy that uh, I miss that energy about being a teenager. I wish I could <laughs> I could get some of that. So thank you to Ms. Foster and her team for all the work, and of course the graduation celebrations. I, I think all of us are still in that in that mindset. In that I I I think I attended eight graduations. I I lost track. Uh, one of them that stands out was at Adelante Charter School. Uh, Mr. Banning and I were there, and uh, Mr. Bolivar, the principal, you could see his his joy, his love for his school. He was so happy telling us that he had applied for the Presidential Acad uh, Academic Award of Excellence, and this is the first time that he was giving that to his students, and it was just... Like I said, amazing to see the love, the care that this principals, the staff members have for the students. And of course, graduation is not only for the students, it's for the families also. That's the uh, uh, board member, Beto uh, and I were at Franklin School and I think we kind of tackled each other trying to find out the diplomas. No, let me do that, let me do that one. So that was a great privilege. And of course, I was at those Pueblos High School as well with Dr. Maldonado. That was uh, that's just incredibly amazing. And I'm so thankful and grateful to all the cabinet members, uh, Dr. Maldonado, the teachers, the principals, the classified staff members, everyone that, because it, it's a team effort. All the work that is put into this culmination of graduation and of course, students, congratulations to all of you. And on the school business side and legislative side, that is not as fun, but it's important is, um, I don't know if you have heard Dr. Maldonado that a claim has been filed at the Department of Education to see if we can get funding for TK, for the TK mandate. And that is something that I'm gonna follow very closely. There might be an opportunity for us to provide our support, either as individuals and perhaps the board can consider us a board. So I'm keeping an eye on that and um, more to come on that. And also a big thank you to all the principals for being here tonight after last week. I'm sure you're exhausted. So thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to hear from all of you. I love hearing what you're doing. And thank you, Ms. Alvarado. Thank you, Dr. Monroe, for your leadership in this wit and wisdom. I look forward to hearing more on that. So thank you. Mr. Escobedo. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Last week was so fun, going to all of the graduations. And if anyone was curious, um, my colleague, uh, Miss Alvarez, is far stronger than I. And I got boxed out when <laughs> her niece was coming up, and I had no idea what happened. Just to mock it. Um, I did say excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just so fun. Uh, it's my first graduation season while on the board, and uh, you just see the joy, the um, pride, the sense of accomplishment from uh, family members to friends to the students themselves. Um, and also the teachers and the administrative staff and the principals and just uh, at each stage marking how big of an accomplishment it is. I was at the um, Adelante promotion ceremony for the kindergarten kiddos. And um, even at that stage, the level of uh, excitement from the kids. And I remember there was one uh, young boy who was crying because he didn't want to leave kindergarten and <laughs> go into first grade. And I just, that's the sort of impact that our teachers and our our schools and our administrative staff leave on um, our kiddos. And uh, I also got the pleasure of attending the Franklin promotion ceremony and the promotion ceremony at Santa Barbara Junior High. And uh, at the junior high, I got to see, so I live on the east side and we have kids that uh, play uh, around in our neighborhood and ride their bikes. And sometimes like the ding, door, ding dong ditch my, my house. And that was my initiation ceremony when I first moved into the east side. 
watching those kids cross the stage at Santa Barbara Junior High and getting to to see them and congratulate them was such a cool experience. Um, and then finishing it off at Santa Barbara High School. And um, again, as these uh, young adults really are uh, so excited for the next uh, challenge, the next opportunity in life. And um, this time of year always for me is kind of bittersweet because I'm on the college scene. I'm in higher education. So I see so many of my um, the folks that I work with move on to jobs and grad school and those sorts of things it's kind of cool uh seeing it on the high school stage and um they're equally going to exciting opportunities so last week was really fun uh in terms of business updates um the housing ad hoc committee has met twice since our last meeting and uh dr maldonado and i actually attended the housing authority commission meeting in which they approved un unanimously the MOU that we had approved at our, our last meeting and shared so much excitement for the partnership and so much excitement about what this could mean, not only for the school district, but for our community at large and really being leaders in this space here locally um, and regionally, to be quite honest. So uh, what we have now um, on the docket is uh, a few exciting things. So next Friday, we're going to do a tour of housing authority projects to get a sense for the type of work that they do. Um, we're hoping to invite our labor partners to uh, also start including them in the discussion. One exciting um, piece is that we also released a survey. And uh, at this time of the year, I'm sure everyone's excited to start their summers. But even with that, we got, I believe, more than 400 responses uh, for our staff and our employees. So uh, questions that would give us some information based on need. So what type of housing do our employees need? Um, what sort of, uh, what are they looking for outside of that? We've talked about um, child care spaces and what that means for, for any sort of project if we decided to move forward with it. Um, so really exciting, we're really excited to, to take a look at that data. Um, we've also had some generosity from our community. We had, uh, I want to uh, just acknowledge that Dennis Thompson, he's an architect here locally, um, has volunteered his time where it could be helpful for the housing authority or us. Uh, he has experience in uh, green buildings, but also doing working with nonprofit developers, which this is kind of ideal for that space. And so just wanted to uh, extend my gratitude to, to Mr. Thompson. Um, and I will finish out by just saying congratulations to our retirees. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Curry. Thank you so much for all that you do. And congratulations to Dr. Martinez. We're hoping that we can get the tech fixed um, to hear from you as well. Um, and then thank you to Ms. Alvarado and Dr. Monroe for um, your work on the wit and wisdom. To have that many folks take time out of their summer, especially at this time of the summer, to participate in the professional development speaks to me about how excited our teachers really are to implement a new curriculum. And this is a really exciting time for us. Um, but it doesn't happen without leadership from folks like you. So I just want to express my gratitude to you both um, and to the whole team as well. Uh, and so with that, I will say um, happy Pride Month. And um, that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Escobedo. Ms. Minos. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Kavya, you're still going to be here next meeting. And I have learned a lot from you. And I'm sure we'll continue to to learn from you. It was a pleasure um, to have you on the board. And I've, you know, it's just, I can't even say it. <laughs> Thank you. I also attended um, graduations this past week. I attended the Roosevelt graduation and the Cleveland School graduation on uh, Wednesday. And I attended La Crumba Junior High graduation along with um, President Sims Moten and had the pleasure of seeing the um, the junior high graduates. And um, and then 
with those schools, it's just amazing. I had to keep reminding myself that they were um, sixth graders or eighth graders um, because the wisdom that they had, the poise and the um, the speeches that they gave and the wisdom that came from them was just amazing, just very impressive. Um, <clears throat> I also attended San Marcos High School graduation and got a chance to hang out with um, Dr. Lynn Sheffield, with Dr. Stanley Monroe, and with Denise Alvarado. Um, Mr. Holdwin was very welcoming of us, and we were there celebrating with the students. We got to go in the auditorium and hear you know the students and just check out their graduation cap artwork and freedom of expression and such and just you know what what a treat it's the one time of the year that we get to celebrate all the hard work and all the accomplishments of our staff and um, parents uh, proud parents with all their balloons and and um, cheering on their um, their graduates so that was quite a pleasure um, to to see um at that time i um also got to hear about the participation in the trainings this week from um denise alvarado who told me about how you know impressive it is for this time for the teachers to um sign up for the trainings being that it's their first week of summer and they could be just you know enjoying um some uh, leisure time and that they're there for the students to learn about the wit and wisdom uh, curriculum. So thank you to you and to Dr. Monroe and all that are involved in that. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize the Pride Month celebrations. Um, I looked up some of the information and found out that the federal government first recognized the month in 1999 when President Clinton declared June Gay and Lesbian Pride Month. Um, in 2009, uh, Barack Obama declared June LGBTQ+, I'm gonna add, <laughs> Pride Month. And on June 1st, 2021, President Joe Biden declared June LGBTQ Pride Month. Um, I think the the safe, you know, feeling safe and being able to express yourself in terms of your own gender identity is so important. Um, we need to have a climate of inclusion, have, you know, the literature, the art, the song, and all the creative expression and personal, hearing about the personal lives of everyone um, and learning from each other, you know, at, at the same time. Um, so I'd really like to make an emphasis in that for both for our students, for our staff, and for our families. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my board remark. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Venice. Mr. Banning. I, I will uh, withhold my remarks about Kavi until next week or two weeks from now. So she... Uh, I, she's promised she's going to be here one more time. I'm not quite sure why, but um, I also want to say thank you to the retirees, to Dr. Curry and the others who, for one reason or another, won't be with us next year. You'll be missed, and we have... Oh, oh man, so sorry. Uh, you'll be missed, and we appreciate what you've given in your time here. Um Principals um, that were here, I appreciated learning about SPSA, uh, the way they're linking to LCAP, which makes so much sense, and the, and the uh, attention to the safety plans and the mental health and well-being of the students. Um, really important stuff. Like many of my colleagues, all of my colleagues, I attended some of the year-end events. I was at the Adams Open House and, and just impressed. They had a huge turnout, not just wandering around, but for a meeting beforehand. Um, the art program that was was uh, featured in the, in the gymnasium, I know they happen all over, but I had a great conversation with the art teacher about the planning that goes on so that every year it's something different for every student. Um, I went to Washington's open house as well and saw great turnout and, and lots of happy people. Um, 
I attended the State of the Schools event for the first time as a, as a board member. And I, I often went um, when I was a superintendent um, in Goleta as a, a feeder district, but it was uh, really well organized and well done. And I want to commend Dr. Maldonado for her comments and the message that you gave in support of our community there. And a thank you to the Education Foundation for helping make that, that happen. Um, I also attended a, a, a band boosters event for San Marcos High School where my, Becky and I got to have hot dogs and watch this incredible drum line do their thing with seven marimbas out in front. And it was just, it was fabulous. And, and I met a parent there who was a uh, an employee in Goleta that I was there that told me all about their child's incredible experience in middle college. And I've been hearing more about that recently. And it's a program that I'd really like to learn more about, but uh, it's got a lot of, a lot of support. Um, I went to Monroe's promotion and I'll tell you, um, it was everything to me that an elementary promotion should be. It was fun. It was, it was um, the junior high draft. And so every student was drafted by a junior high school and they got to talk about them. It was really a, a wonderfully organized event and very creative on the part of their staff and their and their leadership there. I attended Washington's promotion as well, which was um, a more traditional formal, um, formal event with student speeches and incredibly articulate people and a spectacular view of sitting, uh, sitting out and watching the kids against the backdrop of a beautiful ocean sunset. Um, I was at the Goleta Valley Junior High School promotion, and as a former music teacher, I was so happy to see a, a full a, a full band uh, doing the music for them. And the choir that sang, the the, the uh, choir came up and sang, and they were just terrific. It was wonderful. Um, uh, Trustee Alvarez has told you that I was also at the Adelante Charter promotion, and I would agree with everything she said. Um, uh, Mr. Bolivar was just so excited. But what made my day on that one more than anything else is when one of the students received the Washington or the uh, the um, uh, Presidential Academic Award, the family and people went berserk as if they had just won uh, the some fabulous uh, uh, Olympic medal. It was it was so exciting to see that really very good. Um, so all that said, I, I, I've been thinking, you know, the challenges that we as a board, as a district, as a community, and our nation are facing are real, and they're important and complex, and they certainly need our time and our persistent attention. But in spite of that, each of these culminating year-end events that we're just talking about is about helps us rem helps remind us that despite these challenges, there are abundant reasons to celebrate the quality of our students, our staff, and our leadership, and the engagement of our community. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just conclude with a uh, yes, ditto, I echo everything that someone said. I was cross enough. I was going to say that. No, okay. They already said that. Piece. So <laughs> that's good that we have like minds and like enthusiasm about the work that we're doing up here and also meeting uh, the challenges just such as uh, Board Member Manning just spoke to. Uh, yeah, the state of the schools was, was awesome. It, it just does my heart good for all the things that we are beginning to see at the fruits of our labor every day. You know, and we're taking those steps forward to continue to be unified uh, as a district, uh, taking things head on uh, and challenges that we have to do and also seeing, seeing the importance of the students reaching their achievement and, and their potential. And we see that at the graduations and we see that when they're so proud to share their work. And, and I would say, yes, I also attended uh, La Cumbre Junior High and some of those speakers are awesome. You know, like, I don't want to go after them because they're already, you know, they're, they're ones, you know, they're wonderful and enthusiastic and, and, and well on their way uh, to, to their next uh, level of school. I uh, also had the opportunity to attend, um, I think it was Dr. Monroe was the Santa Barbara Community Academy where they were reclassing some of their, their students there. So to see the reclassification and the number of reclassifications that are going on, that also says the work that is going on. We know we have to continue to, to have that, but to see that sets in the numbers that we're seeing is really good. So again, one extend uh, congratulations um, to those students and the teachers and, and parents and community who've supported them to get there. Also had the opportunity to uh, attend La Cuesta and Alta Vista High School um, graduation at the courthouse. That's one I check off every time. Like, it's for next year. I'm already there, right? Just to see that that I just appreciate the the five high schools that we have really fits the needs of all of our students. And that's really, really important in terms of all the schools that we have, 
there's a place for all of our students to succeed. So I just wanted to extend that a graduation for the work that they've done. And I think Dr. Um, I'm calling you doctor, but Mr. Escobita, we had so much fun. We had probably more much fun at the Santa Barbara High graduation. <laughs> uh, you know, we had a lot of fun there and uh, it was really exciting and to see them come through and so like, I, you think they just knew yesterday that they were graduating. Maybe they did. I don't know. But they, they were very, very excited about just being, you know, ex excited for, for that and also had the opportunity to attend Harding uh, Elementary as well. Uh, Miss Alvarez and I, Dr. Monroe, and, and a little bit there because I know you were balancing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we were trying to, <laughs> she was trying to be there. And lastly, I would just say that I attended uh, the um, Adelante. They had a play, uh, Aladdin. And it was so beautiful to see, you know, I'm all about my little ones, right? So there's brothers and sisters and, and just folks that they go to school with. The sixth graders were doing this play and they knew every step of that play. The little ones, on they, it's like you had two going simultaneously. And uh, so they knew every step and they were singing all the songs. And so I just, you know, want to say that, you know, little ones are always watching us. So we just we have to be, and they do replicate what we do, even good and bad. So we have to be real careful about that. So I was really um, pleased to be able to see that, that, um, to see that play and was and grateful to be invited invited to that. So uh, I would end with just saying that as as, as um, Mr. Benning has said, I, the challenges um, that we face and we face them head on. But I it does my heart so good to be able to talk about the things that as a Santa Barbara Unified District where we're going in so many spaces we are leading the way being courageous in the work that we're doing, being steadfast and where we have to do at the same time, you know, you know, looking at a mission to make sure that we are creating uh, a world that's yet to be created. And the last thing I would say is that I attended um, a meeting with um, Federal Reserve folks on another space, but she was saying, what is the, what is the, uh, and she's the outreach coordinator. So she goes out and, and, and seeks information. And she was saying two things that they're focused on is price ability, which I'm assuming has to do with, you know, uh, inflation and recession, all those things. But the second one's about maximum employment is one of the other pieces. And what she said about that is that we want to make sure that we're creating the conditions and the environment to achieve maximum employment. And I think that's exactly what we do in education. We need to make sure that we can have reached maximum success and potential, and we need to create those conditions in those environments so that can happen. So I want to put that as a call to action as we start to do that. And we're starting to do that in everything that we're doing at the same time addressing whatever challenges that may come ahead of us. So thank you for that. And thank you board uh, for your comments and Kavya and Dr. Maldonado. So next we'll move to, uh, oh, okay, we got Deborah. Okay, Deborah, Dr. Martinez. Hi everyone, can you hear me now? One second, Dr. Martinez. Can you hear me We gotta get you on screen here. Okay. Oh, we're going to have your sound up. Do you want to put it on? Okay. Okay, go ahead and start. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just so excited to be here. Um, good evening, Superintendent Dr. Maldonado, Board President Sims Moden, members of the board, district leaders, and the community of Santa Barbara. I would like to take a moment to thank you for the opportunity to serve as Director of Educational Equity and Multilingual Learner Support. I feel privileged to serve in the role that is intentionally designed to ad advocate and lead on behalf of students that are uh, traditionally underrepresented populations and students whose uh, home language environment includes a language other than English. I share a deep connection uh, to many of the multilingual learners, as I also have a story of many firsts. Uh, I am the proud daughter of a first-generation American citizen parents who originated from Zacatecas, Mexico. My uh, siblings and I are within the first generation of American uh, children in my family who attain higher levels of education. Uh, I have firsthand experience on how an equitable opportunity for a rich education transforms families. Uh, as a former bilingual teacher and assistant principal, K-12 coordinator and elementary principal, I look forward to just enhancing the structures and uh, celebrating educational systems that we can co-create on benefit of our students in order to help them thrive and excel in our, and, and maximize their potential in learning environments where they have uh, a sense of belonging. So I wanna just thank you for this opportunity and uh, 
I know you have a wonderful translator, but if you allow me, I would like to share my message in Espanol. Is that okay? Buenas noches, Doctora Maldonado, Presidenta de la Mesa Directiva, uh, Mrs. Uh, Simmons Moden, miembros de la Junta de, 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 de Líderes del Distrito de la Comunidad de Santa Bárbara. Quisiera tomarme un momento para agradecerles la oportunidad de servir como Directora de Equidad Educativa y apoyo a los estudiantes multilingües. Me siento privilegiada de servir en un papel que en esta que está intencionalmente diseñado para defender el y liderar en el nombre de el, las poblaciones y estudiantes poco representativos, cuyos entorno lingüístico incluye un idioma que no es el inglés. Uh, comparto una conexión profunda con estos estudiantes multilingües, ya que también tengo una historia de, de muchas novedades. Soy de la orgullosa hija de eh, ciudadanos estadounidenses, estadounidenses que originaron en México, uh, que son de Zacatecas, México. Mis hermanos y yo uh, formamos parte de la primera generación de niños estadounidenses en mi círculo familiar alcanzar una educación universitaria. Tengo experiencia de, uh, primer, de primera mano sobre cómo una, la oportunidad equitativa en una buena educación puede transformar la vida de una familia. Como, como he sido maestra bilingüe, traigo un, uh, una perspectiva como maestra, como subdirectora, como coordinadora y directora de una escuela Uh, y espero mejorar conjunto con el equipo, uh, estructuras, celebrar sistemas educativos que podamos crear juntos que beneficien a nuestros estudiantes para que progresen y sobresalgan a su máximo potencial en un ambiente de aprendizaje donde eh, tengan un sentido de pertenencia. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctora Martínez. Okay, so we will now move to our public comments as you're getting those. I also want to just mention thank you to the principals and all the work for the conversation. Uh, today was really exciting. I know we we're going to try to uh, schedule some more time, so they really want to come back. So just appreciate of the, the efforts that put forth for the presentations today. So we'll move to public comment. We have one public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, we, we have Mary Wright, please. Uh, turn on your microphone, will you? There's there's a button that says push, and the green light will come on. All right. There thank you. you. Yeah, like you, I am a teacher, or was back in my day. I speak about five languages, although not too many too well. I'm starting to learn Swedish. I graduated from the Sorbonne in Paris and Alliance Francaise. I didn't become a born-again Christian, though, until about 10 years ago. And um, I thought I knew it all. I thought I was a great teacher. And I see you all giving kudos to each other. And that's great, the work that you do. I, I think that's wonderful. When we veer, though, from God, though we're really um, playing in awful territory. I noticed your mission statement out there. We prepare our students for a world that is yet to be created. I wonder if any of you know what's about to happen to this world. Have you ever read Ezekiel in the Bible or Daniel? Jeremiah, they were all prophets. The Bible is not a fable book. It's the history of Israel, basically. Israel became a nation again in 1948 after they were spread all over the world. And one day they became a nation and Ezekiel prophesied that. He also prophesied that soon after Israel became a nation, Satan would try to take over the world, which he's doing now because he's promoting evil. And I notice that you all said the pledge of the flag one nation under god yet i wonder in your um <laughs> support for lgbtq how much you're supporting god i don't think so it's not written in the book that we have multiple genders god created two genders and what satan does in the end times as he has done in through history is try to confuse people with untruths it sounds good Sounds good. But he's not as original as God is. He copies. He tries to copy God. He doesn't do a very good job, like with the pride flag. The rainbow is God's. You know what rainbows are. They're real. God put them there to let us know that he would never flood the world again, as he did in Noah's days, because of the sins committed by the people. So I would, I can't talk to you about the whole Bible in three minutes, but I know that God is real. And he's working 
and he does forgive our sins. None of us is perfect. Some of us like to think that we are, but the world is disappearing. It's going to end very soon. And God's new kingdom. 30 seconds. Will come in. Read the Bible. Study, listen to Andy Woods on Google. Not Wood without the S. Andy Woods. He's a uh, lawyer and a very good commentator on the Bible. Teach yourselves so that you can save yourselves from what you're doing to our children. It's horrible. Thank you very much. And I, I really hope you continue with your good works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now move to our consent agenda. Board members, do you have any items you wish to pull? Seeing none, may I have a motion? Actually, I you do. Have okay, one. Superintendent. You call for board members, but <laughs> <laughs> do I need to now include you in that? So, okay. uh, consent agenda okay. item number twelve. We're okay. going to ask to pull, and we'll be back a little time because I believe Mr. Ramirez has found a better deal for us that we will be bringing at the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that correction, board members, may I have a motion to approve all agenda, uh, agenda consent agenda items except item number 12 being pulled? I move that we approve the consent agenda except for item number 12. Second. Okay, it's been a motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Right. Um, we have a time certain at 7.30, but I have a couple minutes. So uh, we'll go to, uh, before our public hearing, can we take the uh, H items one and two real quickly um, there? So. I move that we approve case number 20-22-23-25, uh, student and family services as presented. Second. Moved and seconded, may I have a motion? Excuse me, may, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes number two. I move uh, the board approve student discipline case number 20-22-23-27 as presented. Second. Okay. Motion second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Motion passes. That puts us up. I don't think anything quick enough. Um, let's see if we can do those. Um, so we'll go to action um, item H3. May I have a motion? Do you want to? Do you need a presentation before, or normally they come up? Well, I, did, I think you had an opportunity to hear about the SPSA plans, the way we've organized and linked initiatives this year. I think is really powerful, um, and we're getting much better at all our data systems and really setting reach you know measurable, reachable goals. You got a chance to see safety plans as well, that are, and how all things are really linking up and connecting, creating the coherence that we need it. So if you have no questions for us, I'd like to have approval of the SPSAs. Okay. Board members, any comments or questions? Ms. Alvarez? A big thank you. Uh, gratitude to the principals for being here this evening, for to their team that it's involved in getting these plans together. Thank you. We really enjoy hearing directly from them. So thank you. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the school site, school plan for student achievement. Okay. Yeah, here a second. I second. It's Alvarez. In motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 I think we have a quick one and H4 as well. Any comments or questions? Mr. Dr. Again, I want to just thank, uh, in this case, the student and family services for also adding goals to our, our safety plans that are beyond just the physical safety of our schools that we've generally been accustomed to doing with safety plans, but really looked at health and wellness and emotional safety and so forth. And um, again, thank you to the principals. And with that, I'd like to ask for the approval of the safety plans. Okay, comments from the board. Otherwise, may I have a motion? Uh, I so move regarding approval of the school site safety plans. A second. Moved and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Now we will move to our public hearing. We'll close this one. We'll move to our public hearing on the Santa Barbara Unified School District 23-24 fiscal year proposed budget. Sorry about that. Yeah. 
Perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Um, so this is the actual um, opening of the hearing for the adopted budget, the public hearing. This is kind of the, the introduction to you to the adopted 23-24 budget. Um, our budget is going to come to you in actually three meetings. Uh, the first one is this one where we um, open up the hearing and we tell the public that they are welcome to come and see our budget um, and we'll tell you how to do that. Then in the next board meeting on June 27th, um, we will bring the, the full large um, spiral bound uh, budget for you to, to approve and we'll give that to you ahead of time so you can read it and look at it. Um, and then what happens is the final piece of our budget, the third meeting will be the 45th day revision, um, at which time we'll bring um, a, some more, uh, another budget to you, but it, it's the same one. It's just kind of um, all wrapped in together. So next slide, please. Oh, do I have a clicker? I have a clicker. I always forget that. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the um, public hearing. It's the preliminary numbers for the 23-24 adopted budget. What this is based on is the governor's budget, which is the May revise. Um, keeping in mind that there are two other state budgets that are all in play at the same time, um, the state assembly um, and the Senate also create a budget. We heard today that those two, uh, those we went off, but the, those two budgets for the um, the Senate and the Assembly have actually now come together, and and we have one budget there. But then there will be a negotiation between those budgets and the governor's budget, and we will have the final budget before June thirtieth. Um, so once that all comes together, then we will do a 45-day um, revision and bring that budget to you at that point. So our budget fully supports the LCAP, which is the Local Control Accountability Plan. We have a hearing on that tonight as well. And it is available for public inspection. Um, you can just contact my um, assistant, Allison Four, to set up a time to look at that, or we can send the budget to you in a PDF form. Um, and then we'll do the final uh, review on 627, the next board meeting. Um, what is not included in the budget at this time, just so that you know, and that we will um, try to get included in the 45 day uh, revision is that additional 2% raise that you um, voted on at the last special board meeting. Thank you very much. And we will include it at that point. We just haven't didn't have time to get it in. What is also not included is the Proposition 28, because we still don't have the full information on that yet. N not the numbers not the not the back whatever it is that we need to uh to do with that so we're hoping that in the the final budget that we'll have more information on that and, and if so we can get that rolled in as well we also are not including the music arts and instruction plan because that needs to come to you separately and that's not ready um yet but it will be so clicker nope oh we did it oh i went backwards oh my gosh hang on there we go, Lacey. Okay, this uh, this slide comes from our L comes from the LCAP. It is um, part of the budget overview for parents, and it shows how our budget supports the LCAP, and it re represents the projected revenue by funding source. So, in the pie, um, one of the pies, the pie on the left, you can see that we uh, receive funding from federal, state, and local agencies. And then the biggest uh, piece of the pie there on the left is our total LCFF funds. And those are made up mostly of local property taxes, which, um, let's see. Um, and the LCFF is based on our local control funding formula. So that formula is what um, drives the pie that is on the right. So that funding formula calculates how much we need to set aside into our supplemental and concentration grants. So you can see at the bottom um, for next year, we will be setting aside 23 million to go towards the um, supplemental and concentration grants that 
support all of the goals and actions in the LCAP. Hey, do we have any questions to speak on this item, Ms. Morris? Okay. <laughs> I, I was enjoying the numbers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, board members, any comments and or questions? Ms. Alvarez? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. First of all, thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Thank you, Ms. Um, Lacey. Thank you so much for all your work. I know it's a lot of work. Would you explain for the public benefit how the twenty the, where the source of funding for the twenty three million twenty five thousand seven ninety three, and also how do you come up with that number? So that number comes from the LCFF funds, which are mostly made up of local property taxes. And the state has the um, local control funding formula, which that's what LCFF stands for. That formula, um, it's based on our unduplicated student count. And it um, that formula generates how much we set aside um, for the supplemental and concentration grants. So as our unduplicated numbers go up, um, we're required to set more money aside. If our numbers go down, then there would be less money that we're required to set aside. Yeah. Let me just add one thing. So to be clear, we don't really get extra money for that, the LCAP. It's all part of the same bucket of money that we receive for mostly through local property taxes. So as that goes up, we just have to, you know, shift our, our general fund bucket and um, allocate those funds based on their actions and goals. Thank you. Additional questions, Mr. Escobedo. Um, Ms. Fernandez, you said if folks want to take a look at the budget, they could email you and you would send them a PDF copy. We could do that. Is it possible to put that somewhere on our website so that um, they don't have to go through the step of reaching out to folks if we can make it readily available? I think we could probably do that. I'll, I'll talk to our communications person. He's giving me a thumbs up. Okay. So I think we could do that. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Additional questions, board members? I just... Ms. Alvarez, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So for the fund for the summary, is this the right time to ask about the summary, Ms. Sims Moton? Are you there for the fund one general fund summary? Am I there? Or? Is that okay to us right now? Or are we yeah. okay? So we in in your projected budget uh for 2324, it shows that our total ending balance is about 25,593,922, which is about 7.6 million than the year before. Could you shed a little bit of light in that as far as the decrease? So we're actually still reviewing all of the numbers. Okay. Um, that would be something that we would talk about at the, the next board meeting. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Hey, and also just for the public, can you explain when you say unduplicated count? Because that's a number, that's a phrase we say a lot. So can we clarify that? Yes, sure. Um, so the reason we call it unduplicated, it just means the student is counted once. So the the students that are included in, in the unduplicated count are the students who are um, foster youth, who are low income, who are English language learners. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, Oh, thank you. Homeless. What am I missing? Special education. So um, a student can be all of those things, but we only count them once. That's why we call it unduplicated. And it's just, I kind of wish there was a different way to explain it, but that, that's that's the unduplicated count students we're referring to here. And those are the, the LCAP supports those students. Okay, I think that's important as we are now being more uh, on our but on our website to really clarify what that means, just so that for further knowledge they can understand that. Because mm -hmm. we have to remember it each time. But if it's there, maybe as an asterisk, what unduplicated means. So oh, good categories idea. might be something to think about. Are there any additional questions or comments on this part? Nope. Okay, we can move to our next one, which is the public hearing on or continue our public hearing on the now continue to the local control accountability plan. It's part of the same hearing. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you. Good evening, President Sims Moten, uh, board members, and uh, Dr. Malnado. So I come to you bringing the uh, opening up our public hearing for the Santa Barbara Unified 2023-24 LCAP, Local Control Accountability Plan, actually, as required by the Education Code. So the thing is that, um, in particular, that this board meeting, we bring up, we bring the public hearing of our draft of the budget, as well as the LCAP. And then at the next board meeting, we'll be bringing both to uh, be approved. What you have in front of you and hard copy in particular is you have, as you see the front page, which is actually the, the local control accountability, accountability plan itself. I'll just refer to it as LCAP. Um, and I copied for you everything except the directions because I it was a lot of paper as it is, but officially you have to include the direction. So the the document, the full document that was sent to the county education office is like 88 pages. So and that's just the plan itself. And if we could go to the next slide. As um as Lacey presented to you, it, we have the that is these particularly the LCFF budget overview for parents. So you have a copy of that. That will be included in the LCAP when we give the final LCAP to you. So that's on the front page. Uh, next slide. And then we have the annual update for this year. So it shows what we had um, we had adopted last year, as well as what we actually spent this year. And that final column that not only includes our LCFF funding, but it also includes funding sources that address that goal. So it could be Title I, uh, it could be um, federal emergency funds like ESSER II, ESSER III, and so on. Um, and then, of course, the last document you have is, um, the, is the 23-24 Planned expenditures table. The both expenditure tables will be attached to the back of the LCAP. Um, a couple of specific things to um, inform you about. Uh, again, just to be clear, unduplicated pupils, it's actually a, it's a funding term because they don't want you don't want to fund a student who is an EML who's also um, low income. And we have students who are, they meet multiple categories, homeless, low income, um, or homeless, low income, EML. So in order to just be really clean, the state decided to fund, if a student met one of those five categories, then they would just receive that funding once and that's it. So that's how that's a, another way of explaining it unduplicated pupils, that's the actual, the term within the LCAP. Uh, and so the last thing to, um, actually two more things to inform you about, and that would be that we submit the draft to Santa Barbara uh, County Education Office. And so they'll be reviewing it uh, and then they just give recommendations for any changes that we might need to do with it. Uh, we continue to do some fine tuning between now and next week regarding the, the LCAP, but there won't be significant changes, particularly with the funds. One thing that you should be aware of is um, the total fund LCFF fund, which is LCAP funds is another like casual term to, to, to describe it. It's going to be like, um, like Kim and Lacey said, it's $23 million. Um, now, when you look at the total number of funds going into next year, it's showing that it's actually $27.7 million. That means we're incorporating not only that LCFF funding or that LCAP funding, the 23 million, but we're also including ESSER three. We have, which that's the federal emergency funding source, ELO, which is a state emergency funding source, learning recovery grant we have some of that money in there and then as well as we have title one and um with that said um that's my presentation to you regarding this and open it up for public comment any request to speak
We have uh, two speakers on this item and they're virtual. Are they ready? Ms. Connie Alexander, please. Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Ms. Can Alexander, I... can you hear us? Yes, I, I unmute it. Yes, I unmute it. Did, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah. Give us a, a second here. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, please start. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Board President Wendy Sims Moten, Dr. Maldonado, uh, board members and cabinet. I'm Connie Alexander, president of the Santa Barbara NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We are the nation's oldest civil rights organization, 114 years of fighting for equity and change in our country. As I look at the LCAP and we think about it, you know, I see this as an incredible opportunity. You know, maybe when we look at things, we can, it gives us a moment where maybe there's some hope, right? You can look forward and say, ah, I see some hope. But I'm also thinking about that this is about values, because now we'll know where the values really sit with where you spend money. And so if those values are equity, we will see that. If you are ready to create change, we will see that. Black families have waited for decades and they are asking how much longer they have to wait for some of this. We hope to see more funds go to direct student services, especially TK through four. We also want to know how those funds will help move our students in the direction where they are no longer in the bottom. We hope that some of this funding will begin to ensure that all black students are A through G ready. We would like to see less money go for just trainings and more money be spent directly on students and, and families. And finally, we have asked that you fund a position specifically to be of support to our Black students and our families, that they have a direct connection to you in a really different way. So I see, and we see, especially, we see this as an opportunity for hope, an opportunity to move things forward. And we are entrusting that that is exactly what you're ready to do, that our families, our community has waited a long time. And so we hope that that's what you will do this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kemba Lawrence. Ms. Lawrence, are you online? Can you hear us? Hello, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, please start. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, President Sims Moten and board. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to ask that the LCAP committee and the board just continue to show your support of our black and black identifying students by earmarking funds for this their success in the 23-24 budget. Uh, increased financial support of services and tutoring, mental wellness and wraparound family services are desperately needed to increase their success. Um, we also see these services being administered by partners with expertise working with our children in order to ensure that they are seen, that the families are heard and that their success is guaranteed. The financial commitment should be directly aligned with the work of the district supported combating anti-blackness work group and the recommendations of the racial climate survey with clear identifiable and measurable goals so we thank you for your consideration and we definitely as a parent of a black student we are definitely looking for the support for our students um, so that their voices are heard and that their success is guaranteed and that they have a safe um, environment to learn, a safe environment environment to be themselves, and a safe environment so that they can be the best versions of themselves upon exiting out of the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay, board members, comments or questions? So well, first of all, Mr. Vince, thank you. Thank you for all your work. And uh, thank you to the team, whoever else helps you do this. I, I do have a couple of questions. I appreciate that you included all the opportunities that there were for public input and um, <clears throat> feedback. 
how well attended were those meetings? Can you give us an idea? I know you had several listed here. Yeah, the the attendance compared to um, the first year that I did it. So last year I wasn't as was directly involved in the meetings. The, the attendance was low this year. We had low attendance with all of the meetings, including even with the first uh, PAC meeting, we probably had uh, we had 20 people there, but then after that, it, it was less. So we didn't have as much uh, attendance with the meetings. Okay. So. Well, thank you. And I mean, we tried. So that's yeah. what we can do, right? Try and yeah. um, and we learn to do better next year. So thank you. Uh, and I, I want you to know, I did read your work. I read it all. So I thank you. Thank you for doing that. One of the things that I, I might have missed is I did not see in here something related to LPAC preparation. And I would very much like to see that implemented somewhere in our goals, where we do this conscientious, this effort this mm -hmm. support for our students, being that there's such growth opportunities, especially for our EML students in this area, that we do some kind of intentional preparation for LPAC and that that's part of our LCAP. I know LPAC and LCAP, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Right, right. So I, I didn't see that, or maybe I missed it. So we didn't make it explicit there, but I could tell you right now, like, um, the true impact will be on uh, goal one, action three, and action four. Those are specifically focusing on EML students. And actually goal three, um, let's see, I could actually give you page numbers that here. So uh, 27, oh, thank you. Yeah, 27 and page 28. Okay. So both of those in particular, we we didn't fold in the language in terms of the LPAC being in there, but I mean, we can easily do that, fold that in as part of the insurances to, you know, make it robust for our students to reclassify. I, I would right? very much appreciate that. Okay. Um, goal one, action three, that's the academic achievement, I did highlight that because I thought, well, maybe that's part of that that's folded in there. And calling it out, I think it'll serve us to remind us and give us to hold ourselves accountable to right. do that. So okay. thank you. And the other um, comment that I had was um, that I can see that we are increasing our services to, of course, to our students that are in duplicated count and also, that goes with our goals, with our student-centered uh, vision and mission for of this district, where 23-24, we have our total personnel expenditures are over 23 million. And I see that that's targeted to students, to those needs. Yes. And one of the things that I do appreciate, and I want you to, I want you to hear this because many times I focus on the areas of growth, of growth instead of the celebrations. I do appreciate the work that you put into this, and also the fact that yes, we recognize that there's room for growth, and we're targeting those areas. So I appreciate that. So thank you. No, thank you. So thank you um, again for this presentation. Um, just to want to follow up um, on, I, I believe it's on the um, the annual update table. So as we're, uh, I don't know if it's last year, it was last year's goal three, and now their goals uh, one and two is create and cultivate culturally sustaining school communities. Yeah, goal three. Yeah. Goal three. Yes. And then also then on that same line, uh, equitable student outcomes and cultural proficiency. So is it within there? And if not, is it somewhere we could consider putting when we're talking about when the speakers just talked about the anti-blackness, yes. uh, you know, uh, work that that committee is doing as well, as well as the recommendations that are coming uh, from the uh the climate survey. So where does those, when we're having those surveys and we're having those specific things, where does it uh, clearly state or live here so okay. that people can see that there are dollars and or resources that are going to those efforts? Um, that's a great question. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so specifically in goal one was where we uh, funded the 
the assessment on the anti-blackness and racial climate within the school district. So that's where that was. Um, the thing for this upcoming year, what we've done is like making sure that we have robust funding for this, continuing to do this work is within goal one and goal three, because those are two aspects. One is at the district wide level and goal three in particular is like focusing on the student level at the school sites. So um, that's where both of those live in terms of the work that we're going to continue to do as we take the assessment, right, the, the um, recommendations and map it out and start doing that work. Okay, thank you for that. And so as we're going forward with that, as we, we will be having reports back to, to the board, uh, obviously continued on the racial incidents, um, but at some point we're going to start to look at the implementation report. And so if, if at all possible to add this to this report, it's tied to LCAP goal this you know, whether we're adding dollars to that or L or adding um, personnel to that, which is, you know, also was, um, you know, addressed in the um, in the public comments here with regards to what resources are going there uh, in order to make that very tangible. Because it's easy to just to put it here, but it's not as tangible. So though, therefore, it feels like there's nothing being done when there's obviously things being done. But if we can clarify that out a little bit back, particularly on that this very important issue um, that we made a big big, big push to make sure we're starting to turn that around, you know, culturally and, and things that we're going to do. And we have, you know, addressed this community, we are going to do something. And I know that we are, I just think we need to just elevate a little bit more. So that's very clear on what we're doing. This is implementation. We've applied this amount of dollars to it. This is implementation and we've applied um, resource in terms of personnel, just to make sure that people are very clear and they can see that tangibility, there's progress toward those efforts. And I would actually say from your, from the direction from the board that you had asked us to put the goals or LCAP goals that were being addressed mm -hmm. um, and the initiative. So it sounds like that we can actually include as we're giving the report at the beginning, particularly about this subject, not only putting that on the, the agenda, but also making it clear. Yeah, so this kid, there's, there, 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 that the work isn't just about, we've got to start it and we've identified as we get deeper into implementation, start from the very beginning, these are the expectations that you can expect to see as we implement. And it's real clear and it's tied and it's connected, you know, such as we were talking about in, in the many conversations that we were having. And there was a lot of connectivity, which I really appreciated. How are you doing what you're doing and how is it connected to the LCAP? So I think when we start to look at those, that very, very important issue, how do we also connect that as well so that it can see and, the, and, and it builds goodwill and it builds trust. Uh, you know, it goes a long way to build that, to, to, to rebuild that trust about when we're, we're making efforts to do that, that you can see it in every aspect of what you're doing, what we're doing, so that it's not separate and apart, is that when you see it, you can expect that it's going to be there. So those are just some things to consider. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez. I apologize. I've forgotten my question that I wrote that I was going to ask you. On the desired outcomes, my wondering is what methodology is used to determine the desired outcomes? What methods, methodology? Yes, so for, for, exam for example, here where it says uh, for star reading grades, our desired outcome is all students 67%, e page 20, EML 22%. Why 22%? Why not 50% or 10%? How do you, how do, are those percentages determined? So those percentages were actually when we created this the LCAP in in the spring of 2021. So we had to take whatever data that we had and figure out what the percentage would be. So we we just what we did was we actually crunched the numbers in a way that showed like reaching to the level of um not beyond the reach, but also making sure that we're not just below. We want to make it sure we we try to make sure that the numbers were actually, thank you, Dr. Monla, that they're achievable. So it reminds me of the story when you have your with my kids in the class, I would say, want you to reach as high as you can, and they're all reaching high. And then you say, okay, now reach higher, and they're able to you see them go up a little further, right? What we're trying to do with these numbers to get them up to a little further to that level, 
but at the same time, not to be impractical in a way that um, when we were looking at it during that time. So these numbers are static that as from last year and the year before. I have to add, this may not be the place to ask the question, but I, I think it was Miss Alvarado that was presenting about the LPAC. Wasn't it a cost or something to, to take the the test? To, um, I don't know if it's LPAC. There was a, what, it was, but wasn't there some cost? There was some, I, I don't know if, let me go back and look at my notes before I confuse y'all further and myself. <laughs> so I'll get back. But there was something you were making a presentation that we we were thinking that we needed to, um, I don't know, it was the cost of it. It was the timing of it. It was something about our, I don't know. Again, I'll get the question, but I- uh, what, uh, Was it the fact that it's only offered once a year? Yes. Was that the- It MP? might've been. There was some There was some barrier to it, but- I think it was the-, the um, the English language LPAC. 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 Yeah, it's only offered. You can only take it once a year. And there's no, yeah, I thought there was, I'll, I'll go back. There was something that we were hoping that we could work through either with City College or something like that. But again, I won't confuse you any more than I've confused myself. I'll, I'll look back at my notes and I'll, I'll go from there. So I'll own my confusion. <laughs> so sorry to add any to this. So thank you for the presentation. I'll find my notes on it. Um, so if, any additional comments, or, Mr. Banning? I ju just want to say, having having been on the other side of the table and developing an LCAP, actually the first year that it was ever developed, I was uh, working with the Goleta School District. Mm -hmm. it, it's an attempt by the state to mix compliance and strategic vision. It's a, it's a document that more than anything is designed to say, are you spending the money that we're giving you the way that you're supposed to, regardless of the fact that they're actually not giving us any of that money as a basic aid district, right. we still have to spend it the way they want us to spend it. And because it's so specific about unduplicated pupils and the growth of unduplicated undupl pupils, um, it's very difficult to make it a comprehensive strategic document along with the compliance document. So we get kind of confused from time to time when we're talking about things about anti-Blackness and the racism, which really is not part of the funding model for the, for the unduplicated pupils. So what we're asking, I think, of you is to, to help take the hybrid of what our vision as a district is to do these things. And without confusing anybody any more than the LCAP already confuses us, to say, we're spending this money on these things, and you can find evidence of it here in the budget, here in the, uh, in the um, single plans for student achievement, here in the LCAP. When in reality, if it had been a successful merging of compliance and, and strategic, it would all be together. But we still have these pieces that we have to look at separately and, and bring together to truly understand that the district is doing these things, even some of the things that you can't find in this LCAP because they were never intended to be there. They're in other places. And, you know, I think one of my favorite phrases was, if you want to understand the strategic vision of any organization, look at its budget. Mm -hmm. The LCAP is only a portion of our budget. It doesn't address every dollar we get. It shows you where they are, but the, the spending and the, and the plans are only for a small portion of that. So kudos to you for building a document and working as a district to have our principals talking about the efforts they're doing with their single plans, being aligned to this, even though it doesn't have to be that way. I think we're doing a really good job of creating that hybrid that that tells the whole story about what we value by where we spend our money. And I just want to remind the board, people here, and anyone that's listening that the LCAP is a part of a grand puzzle of pieces that are the strategic vision of the school district. Thank you. I, and I would also say that it's really came from in 2021, when we built it originally, it really, that vision was from the community, from our staff, our students, every part of the, the organism, as we call Santa Barbara Unified. Okay? That's why we have specific categories that we try to make it clear 
The second part was being transparent. Remember before the LCAP districts were, it was even less transparent in some ways. So anyway, so I just want to um, just say that it's our community that built this. So. And, and thank you for the work in combining that and, and making it the whole picture of what we are and what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you, Mr. Manning, for those comments. And I, I would just add, the more that we're able to, to communicate and have in those study sessions, that's where that comes from, because it's not always connected. And so where people get their information is where they get it. And if we want them to get that whole picture, such as you're saying, we have to be able to be communicating that as, as a part of our communication to make it so, such as what we said, this document has now come to this part because of community input and all the different things. So if we're wanting to make sure that you're not looking at it from one aspect, aspect. Um, we make, make sure that we're communicating that out, that we have a full budget. And where are you looking for this is in that part of the budget to, to, to the point, Mr. Banning. But it, I think that's continued uh, process improvement on our part as well. So I don't hear any additional comments. I think we can close this public hearing. All thank right. you so much for your time and your presentation both. All right. Thank you. I get that saying that gavel again. <laughs> now I <laughs> think I haven't done that in seven years, so I'm about to take it. No, um, <laughs> so we will move back into our uh, our um, public um, out of a public hearing back into open session. Now we're moving to item H um, five, and we have this is this approval of this is Kim. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Um, this item is an MOU. And the reason why we wanted to bring it forward is just to kind of explain it to you because it's it's a little bit um, different than other MOUs that we have. And it is an MOU with our um, Santa Barbara County SELPA for special education. So our Santa Barbara County SELPA provides the special education for the funding and the guidance and, and all that for the entire county. And we are one of the members of that SELPA. So this MOU is to provide a very specific service to the entire county that would reside with us in a way. So the, the SELPA is not, um, the rules around the SELPA is they're not allowed to provide direct service to students. Um, and so, but they have this really great program that is called a wraparound program. It's very intensive services for students who really need that very deep intensive um, care for mental health. And when I worked at SELPA uh, years, a uh, couple years ago, before I came here, um, I got to see kind of firsthand what, what these um, individuals do. And it's called wraparound because they, they really reach out and wrap around the entire student. They support the family. They support the student. They connect coaches and teachers and, and special individuals in those students' lives together to wrap around those kids that are having very intense crisis situations. And so it's really important work. Um, and in order for SELPA to be able to pro provide this work, they actually need to have a, an LEA, which is a district um, such as ourselves, um, actually kind of um, use, be able to provide the wraparound services to the entire community. So in the past, I don't know how many years, maybe five years, Goleta has been the district that has been providing this service. And Goleta, as you know, is an elementary school, um, school district, and they don't tend to have as much need. And so it was kind of a little bit of a stretch to have them providing that service. We actually use the wraparound service at Santa Barbara Unified. We're the, we're the district that uses them the most. So it kind of made sense when Goleta decided to not do this anymore to have us do it. So um, we as a, a district don't really have much to do with this. Um, SELPA hires these individuals. They evaluate them. They put them to work. 
They sometimes will support our students. They will sometimes support other students in the community. All that we need to do is actually have them go through our payroll and SELPA is going to actually pay us money in order to do that. So it's just a service we are providing by housing. We don't even house them. I shouldn't say housing because they don't actually live on our sites either. They SELPA has places for them to go um, for their desks and those kinds of things. So it's just an MOU to be able to allow us to help the entire um, community that needs these services by just running these individuals through our payroll so that SELPA can use them for direct service to students. That was kind of complicated. I hope that made sense. <laughs> okay, any requests to speak on this item? Okay, Mr. Banning, question. I actually have a question. Um, the concept makes perfect sense to me. Um, my question is, are we, you, you say SELPA is hiring them, but they're going through our payroll. Is there any effect on the maintenance of effort formulas by us having those students, th those um, positions run through our, um, our program? Hmm. I'd have to look into that. I don't... <clears throat> I don't believe so, but I would really have to look into that. I'm not positive on that. It would be five people. Um, I'd have to get back to you. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I apologize for not catching that as I yeah. read it. I read this. I was fascinated by it, but it, it only came to mind tonight. I apologize for dropping a question like that. But. Yeah, if you don't mind, can we pause on check in with Ray Avila and come back to the item because I think that's an important question that yeah. you probably would need to consider before voting. Would that work for the board? I think we have some board comments. Yes. We'll hold on to that. Yes, in kind of along those lines also, they're hired by SELPA. Are they SELPA employees or are there our employees? And we we pay through our payroll are they paid from our salary schedules? No, the SELPA salary schedules. So basically it's a, well, like it's a contracted like, service correct. partnership kind of. Mm -hmm. So all well, the workman's comp and the liability SELPA not as be unified? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mr. Escobedo. Forgive my ignorance. You mentioned the term. Can oh, someone yes. define the term? Yeah, I certainly can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's a little complicated term too, but um, for, for special education, the it's a federal requirement to make sure that the expenditures that you spend in special education, as the district spends in special education, every single year either stays the same or increases. And it's a federal requirement, but it's actually a state report. The state also has to do this check, but it's, if you do not, there's a couple of different ways that you can actually meet it too. But if you have to maintain, it's the maintenance of effort. You have to maintain expenditures. It doesn't have to do with funding. It's actually expenditures. So the question that um, board member Banning brought up was that if we increase our expenditures now with these five individuals, we would have to maintain that now going forward. But when I'm thinking through this, if in fact those individuals were to leave, um, they're no longer in our, in our expenditures. I think that is one of those requirements that we can use that the leaving of employees. I would suspect that that's that's correct. That, that there are certain exceptions to right. the to the lower expenditures, and in, in some a case like this, Galita's doing it apparently. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you for defining that for me. No problem. Yeah. Any additional comments or questions? Are we still holding on to you get information or? I want to make sure, sure we have sure. Yeah. Okay. And I can look real quickly too on the exemptions and see if that's one of them, but I believe that is one of them. Okay. So we will hold this until we get further information yes. for action. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. All right. So then we'll move to um, 
H6, approve of resolution 2022-2336. What would we have coming to us? It's going to be, oh, Mr. Desmond. <laughs> Good evening, board members, President Smith Martins, Dr. Maldonado, board um, and Executive Cabinet. So I'm here tonight to present and ask for approval of resolution number 2022-2336. Um, the resolution requests that the board here uh, approve the lease lease back contract documents, and the resolution authorizes the ex, uh, execution and delivery of a site lease and facilities lease. Um, the purpose of the lease is for San, the San Marcos High School classroom replacement project. Um, the project involves the demolition of um, certain portable classrooms that are on site right now, the relocation of the portables, and the construction of six classrooms and the remodeling of the wellness center. Uh, McGilvery Construction Incorporated is the contractor involved in this lease lease back proposal. Um, Education Code Section 17406 authorizes the district to lease the site to the contractor. The contractor would then sublease the project and the underlying site back to the district once it is complete. The facilities leases include a pre-construction provisions and the construction provisions that the contractor must comply with. Um, the contractor will prepare a project schedule and a detailed cost estimate for construction, a guaranteed maximum price or GMP for the project, and the GMP proposal will be presented to the board at a future date for approval. Um, the acceptance of the GMP is within the sole discretion of the, uh, of the district and its governing board. And in the in in the event of it uh, of the inability to finalize an improved GMP, um, the district has a right to terminate the contractor's services. Um, with that, I would kindly ask the board for approval of this resolution. Any questions? Any requests to speak on this item? No requests to speak. Board members' comments or questions. I do want to just ask one question, if I may. Mm -hmm. Uh, Desmond, can you mention the wellness center? And I know that we have a capital campaign for that as well at san marcos is this the same project or related i believe so but i'll have to verify with marina to um i have to get back to you with that okay i mean if we have the money and we want uh, first of all i've been to the wellness center and definitely needs to be done so yes that's not the question it's not about not wanting to do it it's just more that we will want to make sure that we circle back to the folks that are doing the the raising of the money for this capital campaign. And I believe that the planning department is in talks with um, DARE and, and also the Royal Pride Foundation on that too. I think there's a lot of conversations going on. Okay, Ms. Kavia. Um, This might be like too soon, but do you have information about what would happen to those classes? Um, not yet. Um, they're going to bring another presentation to the board uh, where we will get into the specifics. Um, this is just to start the lease lease back process. And once that gets going, then we can go into design and, and figure out all the details. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here are no additional questions. May I have a motion for approval? I move that we approve resolution 2022-23-36, approving lease lease back contract documents and authorizing ex execution and delivery of site lease and facilities lease relating to the San Marcos High School classroom replacement project. Second. Okay, moved and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Hope. So we'll now move to H7. Is that you too? I'm oh, okay. All right, then. All right. We have a repeat performance. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this next item here is... Um, uh, on an annual basis, the Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District offers a uh, infrastructure, in, in this case is vehicle charging infrastructure grant. Um, for the 2022-2023 year, we were awarded a $138,000 $138, grant for our district office here to put in electrical um, charging infrastructure. Um, yes, I know. <laughs> People are very excited about this. Um, as part of this project, um, we were able to actually reduce our costs when I asked the solar contractors to put in some conduits before we laid all the con um, all the concrete on top of it. So it makes it a little bit easier for us. Um, originally, we wanted to install 20, um, so 10 dual port charging stations, but we've learned since learned that our electrical infrastructure cannot actually support that as is. Um, we were only able to support 10 um, or five dual port charging stations. 
Um, the current plan, um, if this is approved, is we would install three of the dual port charging stations in the back of the La Cuesta parking lot underneath the solar array. And then the two remaining dual port charging stations would go in the back of facilities um, to prepare for our fleets coming in in the future for when we electrify that fleet. Um, so as of right now, um, one estimate that I received for the project cost of this was $216,000 um, so $216,333 and four cents for it. Um, this is going to be a project that likely has to go out to bid, but the APCD has a, approved a $138,000 grant to help us with this endeavor. Okay. Any requests to speak to this item? Okay. No public comment. Okay. It's just Camino. Thank you um, for this. And I'm always excited when you come up. Uh, very Thank interesting you. projects. Um, for this one in particular, you spoke about our infrastructure not being able to handle the full 20. Um, is that something we would be able to upgrade in the future? And what, what was holding us back in terms of actual infrastructure? So uh, if you can, <laughs> very simple. Uh, the simple thing is uh, we have a transformer mm -hmm. and then we have a switch gear. The switch gear can only accommodate 600 amps. If we were to uh, uh, install all to our, all 20 uh, charging stations, it would take up the entire 600 amps. Um, unfortunately, we still have needs for our yeah. sites here. Um, so the plan moving forward is that um, on a separate note, um, we are working on getting some electric vehicles. And as part of that, Edison has a, a program where if you can commit to X amount of heavy duty electric vehicles, they will come in and actually install a new transformer, install um, the switch gears and also everything up to the charging stations um, free of charge. So I am working with them on that so that we can upgrade our electrical infrastructure altogether for vehicle charging stations. Fantastic. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? What members may I have a motion for approval? I move that we approve uh, this proposal as presented. Do I hear a second? <laughs> Sorry. Motion and second may uh, all, all in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Most is passionate. Thank you, Mr. Hope. Thank you. All right, we're moving to H8, adoption of permanent substitute pay schedule. Oh, she's back. Wait, wait. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and you're next up. So, thank you. So, we're going back to um, H5. I was slow. I am sorry. I, I'm a little bit far removed from special ed should have had that answer so but we were we were right so um the maintenance of effort exemption um that the federal government allows you to to use to if you if your expenditures are going down um is the very first one is the voluntary departure by retirement or otherwise or departure for just cause of certificated and or classified special education or related services personnel, it's pretty much everybody, excluding contract non-renewal or staff layoff due to budget shortfalls is one that is approved. So, um, and it makes sense because Glita is no longer doing it. So I would have assumed that they would have had an MOE issue um, unless they use something exactly. along these lines. So we're, we're okay for well, with that. So, so I'd like to apologize for being the poster child of a little knowledge being a dangerous thing. <laughs> well, I'm so, I am, I need to apologize for not being as not, not being faster on the draw. <laughs> okay, so yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Bannon, would you like to make the motion to approve? <laughs> I'd be happy to make the motion to approve this MOU. I have second. <laughs> Motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Motion passes. Yes. S is four and O right now because Mr. Yes. Escobedo stepped out, but motion passed. Yes. Oh, you want to raise your hand? Say aye. All right. Now we have five more. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we will move to um, item H8, adoption of permanent substitute pay schedule. You're up, Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Hello. Good evening, Board President Sims Moten, Board Members and Superintendent Maldonado. 
The item you have in front of you is a proposal to adopt the substitute rates as the ongoing substitute rates for the 23-24 school year and beyond. These rates were initially approved by the board in October of 21, and we have three substitute rate categories. Daily subs are $190 a day. These are the subs who are on the call list and who accept daily jobs that arise due to a teacher's absence. Designated site substitutes, which are $210 a day. And these are substitutes who are designated to be at a specific school site each day to cover whatever needs for the coverage the site has each day. And last but not least are long-term substitutes, which are $290 a day. These substitutes cover a teacher's assignment due to the teacher being on a leave of absence, such as maternity leaves, that sort of thing. So I am happy to answer any questions you may have at this point. Thank you. Any requests to speak? Board members, any comments or questions? Hearing none, may I have a motion for approval? I move, I move approval of this item. Okay. Second. Motion and second, then Ms. She's coming back in. Okay. <laughs> All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Motion passes. We'll move to uh, H9. I think that's you, Ms. Yeah, Ann, as well. I'm just okay. going to stand up here for okay. a little while. All right. I, I think you're the next couple. Three, four. Okay. So good evening again. Um, the item you have in front of you is the annual declaration of need for fully qualified educators and resolution 2023-24 slash 28. So the Commission on Teacher Credentialing requires that we as a district file an annual declaration of need for fully qualified educators if we anticipate employing teachers who have a base credential, such as a multiple subject or a single subject, but are not fully credentialed in specific other areas. So in other words, these are teachers that might be new to California and are in need of an emergency CLAD or BCLAD authorization. Current California teaching credential programs embed the CLAD info into their programs. Out-of-state programs, unfortunately, do not typically have a comparable authorization, and thus there's a need for the emergency CLAD while those teachers work on getting their regular certification. The Declaration of Need also provides the district the ability to apply for general education and special education limited assignment permits, LAPS for general education and CLAPS for special ed. LAPS and CLAPS can only be issued to applicants holding a valid California teaching credential based on a baccalaureate degree and a professional prep program such as student teaching. An example of this might be a science teacher who is teaching a section of math but does not have the math credential yet. The LAP allows for that teacher to teach the section of math for the year. If they are to continue teaching math, they need to be pursuing that credential. The declaration also allows for the district to file for emergency transitional kindergarten permits for TK teachers if they don't meet the TK requirements. Although, what's a little odd that I've discovered is the, tr the transitional kindergarten permit is not specifically spelled out on the declaration of need but you have to have the declaration of need to get the certificate for TK. So it's a little weird. But with that, I will do my best to answer any questions you may have regarding the declaration of okay. need. Seeing no request to speak on this item. Board members, any comments or questions? Okay, hearing no questions, may I have a motion for approval? I so move. That we approve the resolution of uh, declaration of need for fully qualified educators. I second. Moved and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Motion approved. You're next up again, Ms. Hand. Yeah. Like <laughs> I said, I'm just going to stay here for a little while. Okay. So the third human resources item you have in front of you is our approval of human resources recommendations. This item documents the various personnel actions that occur within our employees includes things such as employment appointments, leaves of absence, resignations, reassignments, and terminations. So some of the items that I would like to highlight include new appointments for certificated management since, such as a couple of the people we've met this evening, as well as the number of certificated appointments for the upcoming school year, which is my personal favorite, because that's what I've been doing weeks on end is teacher interviews. So it's exciting to see so many of them get hired. I would also mostly like to honor our classified retirees that are mentioned on this report as well. Kirk Martin, Penny Rankin, Fred Romano, and Mae Trina. 
Again, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding this list. Any requests to speak on this item? Board members, any questions or comments? Seeing none, may I have a motion for approval? I move for approval of the human resources recommendations. I second. second. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Go for it, girl. Motion and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes. I just want to thank and peek before you go to the next item because she's pinch hitting today for John Becky, who's on a much well deserved vacation and hopefully not listening to this meeting. Yeah, thank you, Anne. You did great. I may hear from him tonight. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> great job. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Now we'll move to H11 approval of new classified management coordinator of visual and performing arts pop up program. Ms. Alvarado, you, okay. Um, <laughs> we uh, would like to request the um, official um, official approval of a full-time uh, classified management position for our visual and performing arts coordinator. As you all know, we are currently working on uh, developing a five-year strategic arts plan in our district. We are involving uh, stakeholders, uh, community members. We're involving our VAPA leads and many others in our um, district to ensure that we have a plan that is going to support all of our students in the arts and continue to enhance what we already have. As we were developing uh, this plan, we realized that the uh, process is going to be, it's gonna take a lot more. And so we currently have a position where part-time is, uh, that position is part-time teacher. The other part-time is a visual and performing arts coordinator. That's not enough. We are requesting a full-time person to help us move forward and continue to do the, the great work that is that has already been started with the team. Okay, any requests to speak on this item? Okay, uh, board members. Comments or questions, Ms. Alvarez. So is the so we currently have two part time positions. Is that what you're saying? We have a. You said we have a part time teacher who serves. We have one person who serves part time teacher and part time coordinator. So that's one full time, one FTE, or two different people. It's it's one person, one FTE. So we are adding another FTE. No, what we're doing it's transitioning. Is we would transition. He would likely go back into a full-time music teaching position, and then we would hire a full-time DAPA. So, so when we say the budget impact is 185, 624 is actually less because you're already paying this person. So it's going to be the difference. Is that right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So in remind me title four monies. What and is that already in our budget? This 185. Yeah. So uh, to go to go back to the position that's currently there right now, that's a teacher position. So what that what was designed with that teacher's position was half of the position was teaching, as they were saying, and the other half was to help coordinate the the arts. That wasn't working, as you could see, because yeah. we're bringing this this position to you. That means that he's going to go back into the classroom. So that's not a cost savings because we still have a full FTE. So it's going to be that full amount. The second part of the question to answer was the Title IV. That is part of our budget and that would be directed towards filling in that gap. The other thing to be aware of, as you know, is the Prop 28. And some of that funding source, once we get and we see the full amount, then we can shift the funding source and use... Title IV for whatever may be in use Prop 28 for, for this position to support. Thank you for clarifying that, that the teacher is going to go back to being a full-time teacher, and this is a brand new yes. position. So thank you. I appreciate yeah, yeah, the yeah. clarification. Mr. Escobedo. Thank you. Um, in the job description, one of the items underneath knowledge of is knowledge of curriculum. And I'm curious to know 
why we decided to make this a classified position versus certificated. And if. Yes, so that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we have to make sure that we're in balance when we have certificated management along with certificated staff, we have what they call an R2 report. So we have to make sure that um, our teaching staff is at a much higher percentage. I, I'm not sure what the specific percentage is, but we have to keep that in balance. So what we want to do is make sure that, um, number one, that that stays within the balance so we don't get in trouble with our auditors. So that's number one. And number two, the classified position itself actually allows for it to be a position that's not specified in terms of having certificated management. We could possibly open that position up to uh, other qualified personnel. So you can have someone like, uh, for example, within my position, it's classified, yet I hold a certificate of administration with it. So you could do much more with that position. I also want to add that this area is pretty complex when you look at all the partners and all the areas of the arts that we're trying to manage. Part of the strategic arts plan is involving a lot of our community partners. So you really do need more of an organizer, coordinator minded person. They're not exactly the people that would be looking at the curriculum and implementing curriculum per se, but more coordinating the efforts of many people uh, as part of the strategic arts plan. And, and in previous jobs that I've held, the arts, Coordinating lots of arts people requires a different sets of skill. Having the teacher do it this year showed us how complex it is and the kind of leadership skills you need to do. That kind of complex work is different and not necessarily something those of us that come from the academic space would always think about. And I'm hearing it provides more flexibility. Right. To, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so no additional comments or questions. May I have a um, motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So next we're moving to H12, approval of contracts and memorandums of understanding over 10,000. Uh, student of, oh. Yes, while well, Ms. Kenya Edison <laughs> comes up, board members, what I wanted to uh, ask you for this item, we're trying something a little different tonight. Um, in the in the effort to have more clarity, more coherence, more organized systemic ways of really providing services to schools in the area of mental health and wellness and using our MTSS approach, what I've asked uh, the team to do is to really show you a way that will maybe cut down on so many different times that you have to do contract approvals. And then for you and us and others to try to keep track of, so what was that nonprofit doing and what do they serve and how do they serve? Uh, or even you know trying to think about uh, when does that contract begin? When does it end and so forth? So. Kenya will go on with the presentation. I'm probably not making it, doing a lot of justice, but we are trying something different that will show you how we're organizing our efforts, our people, our time, and our resources better. And um, the rest of the team, it, the cabinet is watching because we may, if this proves to be efficient and understandable uh, and you agree to, we'll try to make use of our time with you and the way that we do our contract approvals more coherent in this manner. So with that, I'm turning it over to Ms. Edison and Mr. Schittler. Thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent, um, Board President and Board. Um, we are excited as Student and Family Services to be the initial folks to uh, present in this way. Uh, what you will see is a, a package of how we support the whole child. Um, you will hear around MTSS. And if you have questions, please ask. There'll also be an opportunity at the end. What you also should see is coherence um, around particular themes and areas that our uh, district leadership team has identified as high leverage. 
For us, high leverage means it checks multiple boxes, whether it's around wellness, academic, family engagement, culture, it checks multiple boxes. And if we invest in and do those things well, then we'll see outcomes. So thank you so much for indulging with us as we kind of go through this process. As you know, as a district, um, this is our work. We are unifying around this work. What is new on this slide for you all is the MTSS. Remember that is our multi-tier system of support. That's one system for Santa Barbara Unified serving the needs of all kids, right? And so our MTSS descriptive statement was drafted by the district leadership team. Um, and I do want to read that for the record. Our multi-tier system of support is a district-wide inclusive, responsive, and data-informed system that ensures growth, uplifts strengths, and eliminates barriers for the Santa Barbara Unified community. And you know it's community, so we're talking students, families, and staff, right? That's all of us together as well as our community partners. So anything that goes into our plan, our one system serving all students, this is the guiding marker for that. I do wanna highlight, as you know, I, I get excited when I hear you um, talking about MTSS and its practices. There are a lot of practices and multi-tier system of support. If we're looking at how we do business, um, it is not just about what's happening in the classroom, it's everything we do from how we hire, onboard, support, how we use data to make decisions. Of the many, many practices for MTSS, the ones highlighted on the slide are the ones that the district leadership team said are high leverage. Again, checks multiple boxes. And they're the ones that as you see cabinet coming forth that we're prioritizing and the information we're sharing with you as well. Um, under administrative leadership, it's that lead de development of a vision, right? We're all going in the same direction towards the same goal. The one that you'll hear a lot of is that using data to make decisions, to guide how we make decisions. What you've seen as we come through is not only highlighting our student outcome data, that's about how students perform, but really also highlighting our implementation data. What are the adults doing or doing differently to get the results that we're getting with our students and really focusing not only at the classroom level and at the school site level, but as a district overall. Um, providing access to instructional coaching. You've heard a lot of information coming out of Ed Services as we link multiple initi initiatives to support this work. Um, we are constantly seeking input from our teachers. That is a high leverage practice. Um, identifying who has access and what the DLT wanted to highlight and who does not, right? So that we can focus our work there. Um, I do want to highlight just a few more. You can read the others for yourself, but identifying ways for all staff to contribute. We, you will see in our proposals for our contracts that's coming forward, as well as the high leverage practices that came out of the district leadership team, there's work for everyone to do. Everything that we are investing in is the capacity of all staff, not a particular classification of staff. And then that second one, which is demonstrate culturally responsive practices. As you know, we provide services for all students, but there's also special populations of students that, re that require us to be very um, in tune, sensitive, and intentional about the services that we provide for them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I just want to highlight two more. That is identify mutual interests and goals. That's that meeting we talked about that was highlighted here with our community partners when this room right here was filled with folks saying, what do you need us to do, right? When we said, well, oh, thank you for your partnership. Did you think about reimagining that? I'm excited to highlight some of those contracts that we've entered into that is our community partners reimagining how they can meet the needs of our students and families. Um, in a very unique way. So I'm excited with those partnerships. And then that last one, or last two, sorry, I said I had one, last two, identify and remove barriers, right? It is a two-part um, phrase. We're not only identifying them, we are identifying and removing them whenever possible, right? And sometimes it may take a little bit longer. We talk, uh, I talked about in here a lot and, and heard my partners talk about long and short-term goals, right? There's some things we can just do immediately and get it handled, but there's other things that are going to require us to be more strategic and long-term um, in removing those barriers, but we're still going to do them. 
And then that last one, which is linking multiple initiatives, which you should hear a lot as cabinet continues to come through. We are constantly linking so that we're working smarter, not harder, and that we're gaining momentum so that we really can transform our system because we believe it and we know it can happen. So you'll hear also from um, the Executive Director of Student and Family Services. Thank you so much. Um, and as we co-present this, do know that we are excited about 23-24 and the experiences that our students, families, and staff will have. Integrated wellness. This is exciting because you're seeing it first, and it's, it's public on, on our website. But when we talk about how do we serve the needs of our students, it isn't one thing or the other, it's everything and. This circle works from the outside in because outside is a protective factors that we wanna establish for all of our students. You saw the principals this afternoon talk about their safety plans and you should have heard some of these same buzzwords, linkage or actions about how do we create spaces on our campuses where students feel like they belong, that they feel valued, that they're connected to the schools and that they have trusted adults that support them and challenge them. Right. We want both of those things to happen. That's that dark blue realm. That is the work that everyone can contribute to. Right. When we ask students, who are your trusted adults? Who do you go to to get help? Or if you have something to celebrate, they can name any adult on campus. And so we want to make sure we support that work. Um, that does enter the next second ring of circles is social emotional learning. Remember, that's us teaching young people to be aware of themselves, right? That's to have the pride of themselves, to manage themselves, right? How do they interact socially within a group? That social awareness is really important. And how do we teach them to resolve conflict, that relate healthy relationship skills? And then lastly, we want them to go off and make responsible decisions, whether we're there or not. Right. That's what social emotional learning is, is teaching young people to manage themselves, seek help when they need it. Right. To regulate themselves. That's social emotional learning. And we're embedding that as a tier one. Right. Every student gets that. Anyone can be a part of building those competencies. Um, after that, we want students and staff and our families to be aware of mental health and what that is, both those positive things that we can do to protect mental health uh, wellness, and then also how to identify the warning signs when, when students, staff, or families are in mental health distress. And so we're investing a lot around that. So once we know a student needs additional support, that center circle, that integrated mental health services means we can't do it alone, right? We've invested by your authority tons of money into mental health supports, and it still won't meet the need of our students and families. We've reimagined the elementary space, and our partnership with Calm is still existing, but they're now community referrals, right? Families will go and see them in the community. So we'll, we're building internal capacity at our elementary by hiring clinicians. Thank you so much for approving that one job description and then the budget for that work. And those mental health clinicians will help to identify and serve and support families, but that's still not enough. We also partner with Daybreak, which provides virtual counseling. When I said we're meeting the needs of various uh, community members, we have families that can't attend mental health clinician appointments during the day because they're at work. They can't come to our campus because that's work hours. So we are providing opportunities for families through contracts, like you'll see tonight, daybreak, where families can meet in the evenings and weekends. Not only that, but it gives them access to a larger pool of clinicians, right? We have all preferences when we go shop or when we're seeking services. We want to give families those same opportunities. There may be a family that really wants a clinician that speaks their language, right, from their cultural background in so certain locations whatever their uh, uh, preference with identity is. Like we have to be able to respond and internally just as a system we can't, which is why we partner. So when we say integrated, it means we're reaching out to our community partners to fill needs that we can't internally. But that doesn't mean we don't try, right? We exhaust our measures. So this integrated wellness approach is the language we want to use about meeting the multitude of needs for students from prevention to intervention. 
from very um, tier one, meaning all students, to very targeted, meaning unique students with unique needs. So that's the integrated approach. I will now turn it over to our executive director. We did not all my little bells and whistles, but it really was good. Uh, I'm sorry you didn't get to see it, but um, she really did a nice job of designing this slide so that it came like one tier at a time. And I'm going to pretend to ignore tiers three and two so I can talk to you a little bit about tier one first. Um, when we talk about MTSS, a lot of times we picture this pyramid graphic. You all have seen it repeatedly and you're going to keep seeing it. Um, it's so much more, MTSS is so much more than a pyramid of interventions. It's the practices that she alluded to that each of us do in our roles. But when we talk to you about contracts, we really want to show where we are seeing these contracts fit in the alignment of our work. And if you notice, there are acronyms next to each of those. It's sort of like a key or a legend to the slide that you're going to see next where we list those different contracts and buckets. Not just because we love acronyms, but we do. Um, I will tell you, though, that those are the practices that were elevated by that MTSS district leadership team. So it's a large group of folks that represent all of our schools that are implementing our MTSS that came together repeatedly this year and landed on these as our consistent commitments. When we say consistent commitments, we mean it doesn't matter which school you're at and what's in your single plan for your school. These are things that are being done from the central office to support all of our schools and all of our students. So they will be um, resources and, and things that are available across the board. Tier two, that's all students all the time. Every one of our students benefits from tier one. And so a lot of our work this year and going forward is to really strengthen that because that's the preventative work that helps all kids. When we bring contracts to you under tier one, you'll notice more often than not, this is an investment in our teachers and our staff. It could be uh, tools, curriculum, trainings, things like that, that are going to live in the classrooms or with counselors that are going to touch all of our students. As we move up in tiers, tiers two and tier three, those are responding to more specific needs that students are showing us. And more often than not, when we bring you contracts around that, that's when we're bringing in partners to help us with the work. So we know, especially on the social, emotional, behavioral side of the pyramid, we can't just say our teachers and our counselors and our other staff are going to handle all the many needs that our, our students have. Um, and so the contracts are really a way for us to supplement and speed up the delivery of services to kids. Ms. Edison talked about removing barriers. Barriers for us could be our folks have capacities, right? And they can't just um, do more and more endlessly. So there are going to be times that reaching out to contracted partners is the way that we can remove barriers and get services to children. Um, the other thing that I'll note, you'll see up in the top right, it should have popped like a firework if we got it to work correctly. But the support is additive, which means we don't take a student out of tier one to give them tier two and tier three. Those are supports that are in addition to what all students are already getting. And these tiers are flexible, meaning students can be in tier three this week and in a month, they don't need that anymore. And hopefully they're back in tier two or tier one. It's not a forever situation with students. And the data is what tells us when students are ready to move between tiers. Um, So I think those are the main points to consider when you look at the contracts on the next slide. The only last point that I want to make is that when you think about the cost per student of these contracts and these investments, that cost per student increases as you go up in, into the tiers. So the more we can invest in tier one supports, we, we, we capture more students with that. We touch more lives with that. When we get up into tiers two and tier three, they really are intensive and by, by nature costly supports. Um, for students, and they're necessary, but there's a reason why the MTSS DLT really wants us to stay focused on Tier 1 um, for a lot of our priority work. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Ms. Edison. So on this slide, we've organized our contracts by tiers because that is the work that we're talking about. And that's all summer few. Um, our all contracts, um, again, as was shared, is really focused on staff capacity because it isn't about implementing an MTSS, it's about sustaining it. And any system cannot be dependent on few, it has to be dependent on all. So that's what's in tier one. Just um, to orient you to this slide, red, 
are contracts that aren't on the agenda tonight, but will be forthcoming and they're in our tier one because we're still working out the kinks with the contract. I won't go through all of them, but I'll leave you to ask questions, but I do want to highlight a few of them from each of the tiers. Um, tier one incognito, you've heard me talk about that. We're continuing that work. That's about how do we help all of our staff identify students who are in emotional or mental distress? How do they approach them not to trigger them further? And then how do they refer them to long-term services? If you recall for May for Mental Health Awareness Month, we had a healthy competition between sites to get as many staff as possible to um, complete the module. Well, as we go into year one of implementation, that every staff will be required to complete it. But we're already more than 75% of the way there because we kicked it off in May. I also want to highlight um, our social emotional curriculum and screeners. So for elementary and, and junior high school, uh, second step will be an elementary base is we've already used base middle school is consistently using it. It's not a, a shift or train a change. And then our counselors offer SEL um, lessons at the high school level under tier two. Um, one of the things that came forward from our, our assistant principals of climate and culture at the school sites is unstructured time. Tonight, when you're listening to principals during the safety plans, they talked about unstructured time. So I approached our community partners and said, what can you do differently or uh, how can you reimagine your services? And really looking at some of the things that were shared as um, consistent across all of our junior highs. How do we engage our EML and newcomer students? How do we ensure, as you know, with the combating anti-Blackness work that we are elevating and supporting Black students on our campuses because they are a small po population? How do we ensure that at the elementary level, we're really fostering friendships and, and, and acceptance and social awareness? So just to highlight, street, um, State Street Ballet will be offering a wheel of dance genres at all of our elementary schools for a six to nine week cycle. This is drop in during lunchtime, right? Kids now can be engaged in the arts. As you know, you heard um, uh, my colleague talk about the strategic arts plan. Me and Denise are, are working very closely to make sure that these initiatives are linking and that students have access during the school day. So we have um, our new partnership with State Street doing that. Sabor Dance Studio is actually coming in to do a wheel of Latin um, uh, dances as well as family nights. So that's important for us to be able to engage with um, our M families or our newcomer families, um, we've reimagined our reception area because what we found was newcomers didn't have a place to land in our district before finding out what the district is and, find, and having questions answered. So I invite you to stop by and see our, our reimagined reception area that is also in response to that need. We also are partnering with um, uh, Healing Spaces as we talk about racial trauma and the experiences of students. Um, this is no different than when we talk about targeted supports, right? There are things that are specific to particular communities of students um, to help build them up or remove a barrier so that they can um, succeed and thrive. And so we're continuously using data to make these decisions. And then in our last tier, I just want to highlight some of our contracts that will be supporting our internal elementary clinicians, our mental health clinicians. Theranest will help them with their um, tracking of their documents um, because uh, there are certain cr uh, criteria for licensure that we have to monitor and support them in. But also I want to highlight our youth outcome survey. We're always asking the question, how are students better off because of what we do? So for the mental health clinicians, we have a a youth, uh, uh, a battery of surveys that we can survey students from beginning to when they're done with their clinical services and supports to see if there was growth during that time. Because we want to have objective data to say students are better off because of the services we're providing them. Also want to highlight ripple effect. As you re recall, that was in response to racial incidents. We did not have a tool that we could calibrate across the entire district. So if an incident happened, that students can not only learn why what happened was wrong, but learn a new replacement skill, as well as learning empathy. And so we renewed that contract coming up for the new year because it is a tool that is necessary um, and works as a response to just regular everyday discipline as well, alternatives uh, to discipline. 
So those are just a few I wanted to highlight. Um, uh, we are open to answer any questions about any of the contracts, but we are excited to be able to have you see as a package instead of piecemealing the contracts on a complete support for students and families. And at this time, I'll open it up for questions. Hey, any requests to speak on this item? Request to speak. Board members, any comments or questions? Ms. Minos? Yes, I'd like to thank you um, both for, for this um, presentation um, and the way that it's laid out so that we could see the relationship in terms of what is being provided, how it ties into TSS, and see it all at once. You know, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Mr. Escobedo. Yeah, I'm going to follow up on that. I think um, for me and probably many others coming in and understanding maybe and learning about NTSS, I think this presentation is one of the best that I've seen so far in tying it and making it really tangible for me. And I think it makes it really tangible for other folks that watch the school board meeting and talking about, okay, tier one, here's what tier one means. And here are all the contracts and the student services that we're pouring into tier one. Now for those students that need a little bit extra um, in tier two, these are the services and the, the partnerships we have to lay on top of that and so far, so far and so, so on. Um, I am just so impressed. I just wanted to say thank you. This is really helpful for me in terms of future conversations. This kind of grounds it for me and provides me with a good foundation. And uh, I think the more that we can do this, I think President Sims Bone made a really good comment earlier um, in a great explanation from uh, Trustee Banning and talking about how sometimes things are fragmented, right? We have all of these uh, compliance and standards that we have to, to live up to, and sometimes they don't gel well together. And so we need to talk about this and explain it and make those connections for folks because uh, I can tell you just from my personal vantage point, sometimes it's not always easy to make those connections. And so something like this is really, really valuable. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation. Yes, Alvarez. Yes. <clears throat> thank you both for the presentation and the nice slides. I'm sorry I missed the, <laughs> the animations, but you can do that next time. Um, I do have a couple of clarifying questions here. I I had emailed you and thank you for getting back to me and uh, Mr. Shetler and Dr. Maldonado about my conversation with uh, attorney Julia Jenkins of the legal clinic here in town and also with the San Marcos High School student about restorative approaches and you mentioned that we were current you were currently in conversations with the Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic. So I realized that this uh, attorney, Julia Jenkins, she's the vice president of their board. My my question is, with this MOU with Santa Barbara um, Legal Clinic, does it provide training for our staff, like for our youth outreach workers, for our RCI coordinators in this restorative approaches? Yes, it actually includes, I believe it's 16 um, monthly uh, trainings, one to be embedded in all leadership, and then the other job alike uh, uh, job descriptions that we believe it should be embedded in. So yes, you'll see that that's included in the contract. And then a per, the, a per hour rate, if we need to extend and add more. And uh, when will this trainings be offered? Is this before school starts in the summer as part of our professional development? Or what? what is your plan on that? The plan is to keep it constant every month. And so we've asked them to do about 30 minutes at each of the leadership meetings, as leaders are the ones who are uh, really most of the time using the restorative approaches, and then building their uh, site. Um, staff meetings. So what they learn at the leadership meeting, we're hoping they then go back and deliver at the staff meetings. And the hope is to start it at the beginning of the school year. So it remains fresh and we revisit every month. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. It's, um, I, I would like to see this as part of our ongoing training with our CSAs, with our campus safety, there I go again with acronyms, with our campus safety assistance and the restorative approaches before the students get to the level that they need to be suspended or expelled or in the legal system. I, I'm very happy that you're doing this. I appreciate it. I thank you both for your leadership in this. And 
I want to hear more, not tonight because it's late, but I want to hear more of what we're doing and this restorative approach is that we're helping the students so that we keep them out of the legal system. We keep them in our schools where they they might need a little bit of an adjustment. So I'd like to hear more on that. And perhaps you can bring some reports later of how this is going. Absolutely. Uh, and then, then the other thing of a question also, how do we know that this is working, that this partners are delivering what they said they were going to deliver, that they're being effective at the schools. Are we getting reports from the principals? How do you know it's working? So one of the things that we instituted for student and family services this year when we had that partnership meeting is we asked them, how do they know their services are working? Many of our community partners are contract funded, right, or grant funded, which means they have to produce reports already saying, this has been the impact of our work. So we asked them to share with us what data they were already collecting. And I have a sheet for every one of our community partners that lets me know not only the data that they're collecting, which we're calling our better off metrics. How do you know kids are better off or families are better off, but also their capacity to serve our diverse uh, community? How many languages are spoken or how many languages are your services provided in? Are they only on campus or do you have evening and weekends? Are you making students come off campus? campus, are you willing to push into the day, right, the regular school day? So I asked a multitude of questions as we assess the equity and access and opportunity. So the data is part of that. And do we get feedback from the principal from the school site that says, yes, we, we, they're doing what they're supposed to do, the kids are happy and I'm assuming you're getting that. So beyond that, right, because doing what they're supposed to do and kids are happy doesn't mean that we're getting the results that right. we want, right? We're focused on better off metrics. So yes, we get uh, that. We, they're a great partner to work with. They're responsive. They show up. And then we get to not only implementation, but student outcome data. Great. Yes. Thank you. And um, another question for the mental health. Uh, I know we received an email from one of our actual employees, and she was very concerned about the fact that we no longer have a contract with Calm, and you explained that. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we're doing this mental health uh, clinicians as our own employees, how is that working? Are we getting enough candidates? Are we going to be fully staffed when school begins? What's What's your take on that? Yeah, so that program we're calling call our RISE program, um, and we have already hired three mental health clinicians, and we have two more to hire. There'll be six total. Um, as you know, as a district, we fund based on an equity index, so certain school sites have more unduplicated count. I heard uh, my colleagues talking about that earlier, so they have a higher need. So that's how we staff the sites. The sites with the highest equity index will receive a full-time clinician at their site, and our, our schools with the lower equity index need will share a clinician and a um, intern. So we are not anticipating any delays in the hiring. We actually had folks reaching out to us saying, hey, we're here, you're hiring, we're interested in staying at the school. I just want to remind folks that we, we our partnership with Calm for school-based counseling, we are reimagined that together. They're still our partners, though, right? We're just referring to them in the community. They had many clinicians who preferred to be on campus, though, who wanted to stay working within schools. And so many of them reached out and said, when are you posting? I'd love to apply. And so we're excited at the opportunity of, of building something new because it's not just for implementation, it's for sustainability. We've reached out to our college partners because we want interns to come in because now we're preparing our future workforce. So we have about two or three, I believe, it's maybe three as of today, of interns who are who are wanting to work within our system. Um, as we link initiatives, we're working with HR as far as getting the, the contract uh, for approval for that. Great. Thank you. And, You're so uh, welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you. And i liked for us to keep an eye on that wait list mm -hmm. that, to make sure that students are getting the services that they need. I know there's times that there's a long wait list list because we can do what we can do, but please keep an eye on that. So, Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Suresh. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the presentation and also to share how I think this approach is just so productive in making sure that no one falls through the cracks. Um, something that I specifically want to speak to is how we have a lot of high functioning students that are struggling with their mental health, are experiencing crisis, but are still able to, you know, keep their grades up or have a happy face in the classroom and attend their classes and not, you know, be absent or be tardy. And so, um, 
with this approach, you know, you have that tier one support for everyone all the time, everywhere, right? And so when you have that base level of making sure everyone's okay, after that point, you can make sure that those who beyond that are struggling, get the support beyond that are struggling, get the support, right? So you're not just like making sure that students, because I think sometimes what can happen um, or the reason people fall through the cracks is when students are responsible for reaching out first for support. And I feel like with this approach and with all of these contracts that we're seeing that address tier one, two, and three, it's not just on the student to reach out when they need help um, at that moment of crisis when it might even be too late, but mm -hmm. instead it's more of an intervention prevention approach. Um, Absolutely. So I think that's just going to be really effective. And I'm really glad that we're going down this path. And it was really helpful to just see how we're addressing all those different areas and how every student will be provided for in the way that they need to be provided for. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I thank you. I agree with all the comments uh, that my colleagues have said. I, and I can feel the excitement. I'm here too. You know, <laughs> my leg is just bouncing. Here. I just really appreciate that. And I know CPI is using a financial thing, but this is about a CPI here that we continue to have process improvement here and how you're coming, how you're adapting to what we need to do and how you have really um, integrated as we start to look at really reimagining what does that look like? You know, the partners that have been partnering with us for long term, you know, you're doing the same old thing, different day, but through this process, you can begin to see that they're thinking, what do they need to do? What process they need to change internally, right? To make sure that we're meeting the needs of today of our students, because our, our students have different needs. And, and I would go back to the fact that this is a part of a process that we are continuing to maximize, you know, our efforts together to make sure that we're creating an environment of care and education for our students. So I, I just really appreciate um, all the work that you both have uh, uh, presented to us tonight and all the work that we see here in terms of this, we are improving the environment for our, our students to succeed. And it's tangibly, and you can see that through our processes, through the results. And I, I appreciate what you're saying. Are we better off? I know we work at uh, First Five about results-based accountability, right? So is anyone better off at the end of what, what, what we're trying to do in holding each other uh, accountable for that. So I think we're just at a new date and a new time. And we're just because time it's all about timing. It's all about where the leadership is and where the mindsets are. And that started to turn change for me when that that day it was raining and this room was full of partners because they should could have stayed away. It was raining that day and they were all here, their raincoats and umbrellas, right? So um just can say that and you can see that here in terms of their what they're wanting to do because we know it, this community would be stronger as we work together and be able to adapt and change as we need to. So with that, um, board members, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Thanks. And a big shout out, Ms. Edison, Mr. Shetler, I have every confidence that this is going to work because I know you're going to hold them accountable. <laughs> You would hold me accountable. So, I hold so, myself <laughs> yes, I know you do. And thank you. I really appreciate I wanted you both to know how much I appreciate your work on this. Thank you. Then motion and second. May uh, all in favor? Raise your hand say aye. 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 Great. Thank you for thank that. You. I'd just say, like to say <clears throat> thank you as well. And board members, please know that tonight starts this part. There's been already some communication to school staff. At some at different levels, the intention next is to continue to roll out how we communicate and present the information for internal staff, parents, community members. So there's communication follow through that needs to happen. So if you do hear from from employees, please send them our way so that we can make sure we check off all the different groups that need to hear how this is going to work. Because I can I can understand why some people are writing to the board and asking questions because we're in development and then at some point we want to make sure we build out the comms the communications I'm using shorthand our communications plan for how this will get implemented so just wanted you to know that we're aware that the next phase will be that thank you thank you with that so typically here board we would take a break between uh, action and uh, reports but as i sent a note uh, we're going to push through and make sure that you have in self care as you need to do you don't have to raise your hand and say i need to leave just you know roll on we're not in class so we're going to move next to i <laughs> i1 oh miss edison okay <laughs> Right. So again, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. 
Um, and I will just say that the work we just presented in the last item um, supports and contributes to uh, being responsive to this report. So I just want to link those two things. Um, so I am here to do our um, agreed upon um, uh, report. Um, and I believe this is let me fast forward. There we go. There's an error on that first slide. It still reads zero. There's actually six incidents to report um, for, for this time period. We'll talk about what they look like and where they were um, located. So we had three at the elementary level, um, two at the junior high level, and one at the high school level. Um, and as we continue to see the work, um, it definitely um, drives home the importance of being early interveners of this work and starting um, as young as possible, which is a recommendation for the Combating Anti-Blackness Work Group, is that we really push down into uh, preschool, not just TK. Six of those incidents were directed towards another student. Remember, it's either directed or indirect, um, meaning it was no target of the conversation, the word, the act, um, but six of these were directed towards another student. As we look at the breakdown, um, you can see the numbers don't add up to six. That's because one included multiple. Um, it included both verbal and a written gesture, I mean, a written um, report. So we had two that were just verbal, three that were verbal casual. Remember, there was probably amongst friends, but they were said to someone. And then we had two that were actual written. I just want to remind you, as I just said, as we link these initiatives, it's more important for us now to be very intentional and targeted on both sides. I'll say not only for the student who is receiving the harm, which is why we have contracts that were targeted um, as we respond culturally for the needs of our, our Black and, and um, African identifying students, but also for the students on the other side of that, those who are causing the harm. This approach is responsive to both. So I just want to make sure that we keep continuing to link. That is the end of that presentation. Request a speaker. Oh, we have one request. Okay. We have a speaker, Barbara Parmet. Are you online, Ms. Parmet? Hello? Hello, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, President Sims Moten and board. My name is Barbara Parmet, and I'm grateful for this board's courage in support of the Insight Survey on anti-Blackness in our school district. I want to acknowledge all the work that now tells us and gives us clear information and evidence of widespread anti-Blackness in our schools. I also want to support the district's engagement with the Anti-Blackness Working Group, which is offering suggestions for the next actions to be taken based on the report from Insight. Now is when the rubber meets the road. How will the district implement the Racial Climate Survey action items? Will you be transparent in providing a timeline in written form and updated publicly at every board meeting. And after the public hearing for the LCAP budget tonight, I hope you will agree to use part of that money to create a district-wide position as part of the family engagement staff to respond to the needs of Black students and families. By setting clear consequences as part of written policy for restorative practices and offering protocols for training staff and parents, then by taking these actions, the district will show itself to be at the leading edge of standards for dealing with racism and anti-Blackness in our schools. So thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay. Board members, any comments or questions? Ms. Katya. Um, thank you again for your report. I just wanted to ask, are we still doing the reporting method where it's someone on campus identifies it and the principal classifies it as a racial incident or have 
we changed how we're reporting the racial incidents? All incidents are reported to the principal okay. and then they're accountable for entering it into the report, the reporting system. Okay. Um, yes. And that includes anything reported on like stop it or say, or sorry, say to speak up and everything. Yep. Okay. Um, just thank you so much. But I just wanted to emphasize that I think it's valuable that we're getting this data and that we're looking at it. And I just wanted to appreciate that we're responding in a way that accounts for the fact that this is not the full picture. Um, I think if we just use these numbers, we'd probably be giving ourselves pats on the back and moving on with our day. So I just wanted to note that I think our responses are of a magnitude that accounts for the fact that this is not what we're actually experiencing. It's just a small fraction of that. Um, and then I just also wanted to demonstrate my immense support for a suggestion that was brought up of including education earlier on. I think it's just so essential. If there's some way we can incorporate ethnic studies in elementary schools, TK, preschools, um, just so students are being raised in an environment that promotes tolerance and inclusivity. And it's not out of your thinking to be accepting. It's natural to be accepting and to be loving of all individuals. Um, and I think we will continue to see progress as long as we address those root causes, which I think is what we're doing with um, the presentation that we had before. So thank you so much. And I just wanted to put those thoughts out there. Thank you. Mr. Escanito. Thank you for the presentation as always. Um, I just wanted to state this again, is that I'm pretty sure the next meeting, we're going to have the combating anti-Blackness work group coming with their recommendations, which I'm excited about. Um, after, after that meeting, I'm really hoping that we can begin the process of transitioning this report and um, making it an implementation report so that Absolutely. there's full transparency. So folks get the full picture of what's being done. Obviously, there's work being done. We just saw it in the last presentation, right? Um, but I'm hoping the same way that we painted the full picture for MTSS, that we can do that same exact thing for uh, our efforts on combating anti-Blackness. Absolutely. And I just wanted to state that for the record, and uh, I'm really excited for the next meeting. So as always, thank you. Um, and always thank you for reminding us that this is the work, the right work, and um, appreciate it. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Yes, thank you, Ms. Edison, for, for this presentation as well. And, and I agree with my co uh, colleagues with regards to, obviously, this is a part of the picture, but also a part of creating an environment where we even have this, you know, to come this far to be able to do that. There's several, uh, you know, uh, strategies that we're using or policies and procedures that we're using to, to get this up. And you don't want to see this, but it is what it is, but we need to be able to see that. So I really appreciate that we're continuing to do this and that we're going to be transitioning to the implementation um, report where we start to make, make that connection. And again, to creating safer space, uh, you know, whether it's being heard, but even if you're being exposed to it, but not feeling comfortable about doing it, that where you feel about, I'm, I'm feel safe to be able to come up and, and talk about this so that our, our, the tone of and culture of our district has changed in terms of that, how we take care of each other in that way. And, and, and by doing this, I do think this is also a learning opportunity. Um, you may not necessarily be the only person, you may not be the person that's being directed to, but if you're standing by and allowing it to happen too, so how do we also look at that as well? So, so we didn't, we didn't. Thank you. Um, I do owe, and I know that you and I met, uh, or Trustee Escobedo about it, uh, the, implementation report. So that is, trust us that we're on our way to make all that happen. Yeah. Uh, and um, the other thing I want to mention that um, we did do last week, I feel like it's been a month, is we also uh, reached out to the Association of Raza Educators, ARE, and uh, Steve Vance and Anna Pilhoffer had a chance to also hear from that group about the reaction. So part of the building of the new report and the implementation and getting all this geared up to go is the outreach that we wanted to be mindful of all the different groups that could give input uh, into how we're going to create the new reporting structure. So that is being built, not yet ready for prime time, but I just wanted to, to make sure that, you know, it's, it's on our to-do list. Thank you. Thank you.
And I would just add one comment with regards to my littles, call them littles. So, you know, at uh, First Five Association across the states have a READY initiative, and it's racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I'd be happy to pass that information along, how we start to implement that at the preschool level, uh, both from um, teachers in the preschool that are in the class down to preschool providers or child care providers. So I'm, I'm happy to present that because we know how we have to start at the root of it and figure out how to go from there. So yes, please do. To, thank you. Okay. I offered that um, resource. So with no additional um, comments and or questions, thank you, Ms. Edison, for your report. We'll continue to move forward. Um, we're now moving to I2, report on ETS staffing reorganization. I see Mr. Tony's coming up. Right. Good evening, board president, Sims Moten, members of the board, superintendent, Dr. Maldonado. Thanks for having me here. I'll be short and sweet because I drank a little bit too much water over there and I got to can't help myself. Uh, tonight, I will be sharing a report with you um, on the plans to improve and enhance our ETS staffing structure really to meet the better, uh, better meet the needs of our students, our teachers and our support staff throughout the district. Uh, ETS, as you may know, essentially supports anything that plugs into the wall and connects to Wi-Fi. Um, but in addition to that, we um, employ many programmers, uh, systems administrators, and ed data specialists that really perform all the magic that happens behind the scenes. So I'd like to start uh, with this by highlighting a story and our history of our department to showcase what we have prioritized over the years, but also to identify some gaps that need to be addressed. So traveling back to 2014, basically nine years ago, we centralized our support from the district office with really four site techs or field techs for 18 schools. It's four techs for 18 schools. A couple of years later, when we added more devices in our tech equity program, we increased that number to six field techs to support 18 schools. Since that time, we have not changed that support model. As you know, in 2020, COVID hit and a ton changed, right? We shifted towards technology use um, that expanded, or I like to say exploded. We uh, advanced in that one or two years more than we had in the previous five to 10. Uh, ETS procured thousands of more devices for students and staff, hotspots, peripherals, and adopted several dozens of platforms um, to be added in and around the classroom. In 2021, the district decided to move all of our data specialist positions from the various departments they were in under one roof under ETS. And I'll note, although ETS grew in size, the work for, uh, from those individuals in those departments came along with it. So it wasn't really a new any new positions. Um, lastly, on this list here in 2022, we added a help desk technician to manage the increased um, need for support of our families and our students. That really sums up the last decade. Um, so now I'd like to dive into the gaps that I mentioned, things that need to be addressed. First one is our ed data division, then our network administration, and of course, tech support. Our ed data division, if you're not aware, manage our manages our various student information systems. Um, the attendance, report cards, enrollment, registration, but also the timely and accurate submissions of our student data to the state and to the federal government based on all of the regulations around um, the parameters of student data. They also provide year-round training staff, um, training of our staff and on our data information processes and ensure that our data is accurate and maintained. Lastly, this team, this team provides support to not just our school sites, but to our charter schools as well. Our charter schools leverage ARIES, and we actually report um, data to the state on two of the three charter schools as well. So over the last few years, this team has continued to absorb several major impacts and additional requirements um, to report that data to the state. We've incurred different technical system changes, for instance, CalPADS, which is the state system to submit data and pull data back down from, completely redesigned last year and had a lot of technical challenge, really putting a, a heavy burden on our staff that we are still feeling today. And another one uh, 
impact that I wanted to highlight is just the growing complexity of our special ed data and the collaboration and communication ongoing with our SELPA that we need to maintain. Currently this year, we have paid over $50,000 in overtime hours to try and stay um, above water and meet our data reporting needs um, for our school sites and our charters. Our recommendation here is to add a leader in this space of a new position of the Ed Data Coordinator. This would provide the necessary leadership to serve all departments, all school sites, and our char all charter schools, keep us organized and accountable with our data. Um, although this would be a cost increase, uh, this has been identified as a big need for a while now. And additionally, this effort aligns with, and it's my turn to use MTSS now, um, all of our um, data initiatives that you're going to be hearing a lot about to improve the quality and accuracy of our data to more effectively utilize project pro, uh, sorry, progress monitoring tools to support our student outcomes, achievements, and wellness. In the next area, I wanted to cover our network administration. If you noticed in that timeline I shared, I didn't mention anything about this. We haven't updated our network infrastructure in quite some time. Currently, we partner with a service provider called Landspeed. We pay them a hefty uh, annual amount of about $150,000 to pay for or to manage all of our network switches, our servers, and things of that nature throughout our district. And we feel that this is a good time to shift away from that and hire um, our own staff to build capacity and develop institutional knowledge within our team. So we'd rather have our own uh, boots on the ground to manage um, that support. We do plan to keep a much smaller contract with Landspeed to continue to manage our mission critical devices like our firewalls and our servers um, in the event of a catastrophe or an outage. Um, that, of course, would have been no uh, no cost increase. And last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are in dire need of more field techs. Uh, we haven't added support since 2017. That's six years of technology growth. Um, in iPhone terms, that's the iPhone 8 versus the iPhone 14 Plus. In Tesla terms, that's the Model 3 when it came out in 2017. There were 50,000 orders. Last year, there were 1.3 million orders. So technology has exploded. So we're trying to tr um, increase our support staff to match that level of technology that we have and use here. We conducted a survey across the state um, regarding our one-to-one -one program, and we had a participation from other, over 40 districts, and the average ratio for, of tech per device that they support is 1 to 1,500. Here in Santa Barbara, our techs support over 3,500 devices uh, per one tech. So our plan here is to increase our field tech team by three, um, and we believe that by increasing that amount, we will have less overhead and less leftover work to fall on our help desk. So we would like to transition one of those help desk positions to out in the field because it is a higher classification. So the good news is we're not asking for any money and this is not an additional expense. Um, currently in the ETS budget, we have our tech equity program. We have all the equipment that we use. Um, we do have aging vehicles that need to be upgraded and replaced, and we're hoping to work with Desmond on that as far as the electric vehicles. And then, of course, these staffing needs. We have developed a three-year plan that will allow us to, um, well, we will be leveraging general fund dollars as well as the creative use of ESSER learning loss one-time monies to ensure that this plan is sustained at least three years. But we will also be um, looking at leveraging additional cost savings for when that money goes away. For instance, our E-rate, we've saved $80,000 a year for the next five years. Our software platform consolidations and reductions are continuing to be tightened up, so we're going to save money there. Our tech equity buyback program saved us recently over $100,000. We're continuing to collaborate or look at our collaboration tools such as Zoom and Slack and compare that to the Google suite of tools that we have to see if we can save some costs there. And we're also in the process of securing a couple of different technology and security grants, one being for student and campus safety and another for cybersecurity that we hope to utilize to help reduce our general fund expenses to continue to fund this uh, 
um, initiative for in those out years. And these are just a few examples of the cost savings that we're going to explore going forward. I know I went a little quick, but that is uh, my report in a nutshell. Uh, we are planning to bring some of those new job descriptions that I mentioned to the subsequent board meetings for your approval, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have this time. Any requests to speak on this item? No requests to speak. Board members, comments or questions? Ms. Alvarez. On slide number five, uh, you mentioned you'll be shifting costs uh, from land speed to the new network administrator. And you also mentioned that we will keep a smaller contract with land speed. Are you projecting that the a hundred and something thousand that you pay land speed right now will cover those two things? Yes, with additional cost savings in that same funding stream, we have other systems that we've pulled back on that I did not mention here, but it'll essentially be a wash in that area of network administration. So what you're proposing is to chain to add uh, as a network administrator. Is that a new position? That was a new position. And also a net data coordinator? Correct. And all the others already exist. You are going to increase an IT support specialist. Is that what you're proposing in a nutshell? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any additional questions or comments, board members? Thank you, Mr. Ramirez, for your report. That was quick and got answers. And we have come to the end, <laughs> uh, at least to start. So I, I want to call our attention to coming events, uh, board members. You see that on your agenda. Um, I think we have a holiday in there coming up, right? Juneteenth. Yes. So we have the summer school. Excited about that session coming in. Um, you let us know that because we want to be able to attend some of the sessions. Sure. Do we have t-shirts this year? I'm just saying. Okay. I'm just saying. This one have my t-shirt to represent. I can represent the old ones, right? They don't have a day on. Oh, oh. That's what we wait now. Okay. So board members, we <laughs> raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> In the summer school. So we want to be able to take advantage of that and to visit those um, sessions up, upcoming as we see the dates there. And then I would call our attention to our... Um, Future agenda items, we have the joint meeting set with um, Santa Barbara City Council in August in the district transfer appeals and two board study sessions for budget and governance and negotiations. Any final comments? I just want to clarify the inter-district appeals is just going to be an extension of an ex uh, upcoming regular meeting. We'll need to make it longer. We are up to 28 appeals. I did ask Ms. Ken, uh, Ms. Edison to set a deadline so that we we don't continue to receive those and we should have already set a deadline so um that is being communicated to families and and just wanted to make the board aware that we will need to extend the length of the meeting to a, a, to allow for you to hear the 20 appeals and we're going to offer them a written they can write to you as part of their appeal or they can come and speak uh, to try to see if we can minimize how much time that will we need it because I believe we give them five minutes each in past practice. Which meeting is that? I believe we're looking at July eighth. Uh, so I keep saying July eighth. July eighteenth. July eighteenth meeting. Yes. So we'll we'll get, give you more information, but I want to make sure I share that data with you. Sure. Additional comments, Ms. Alvarez? Yes, and Dr. Maldonado and I spoke about this. We had two of our EML reports. We have one pending. Uh, the third one, and you mentioned when Dr. Martinez joins us, then I, I want to make sure that we don't lose track of it. If we can add it to future agenda items, please. Actually, that's a great point. Um, what we'll try to do at the next uh, June 27 meeting is bring the governance calendar or some beginning of the governance calendar, and that's where we'll map out the reports. Perfect. So it won't come as a separate, it'll just be in the governance calendar as part of yes, that, all the that's reports. wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, board members, that concludes our meeting for June 12th. I just want to note that we're getting better. <laughs>